Hello, Pool Chasers, and thank you for joining us today in episode 61 of the Pool Chasers podcast. Our mission, as always, is to help educate and inspire in the form of a podcast. We are very excited to share this episode with you as we have wanted to do an episode on in-floor systems for a while now. We had the great opportunity to sit down with Greg Huber and Scott Bushy, who are regional sales managers at A&A Manufacturing. Between the two of them, they have over 50 years of experience in our industry, and we got to pick their brains on everything in-floor. We've just recently got to know Greg, but we can tell that he is someone that is very passionate about what he does. He has been around the industry since kindergarten, where he started working with his dad. He's very knowledgeable and a great help for our industry. And Scott? Well, Scott is an Arizona legend. Everyone out here knows who Scott Bushy is. We've known Scott for years, and since he got the opportunity at the age of 23, he has always been so willing to help people. Most manufacturers in our industry have reps similar to Greg and Scott. We encourage everyone out there to utilize these reps. Reach out to your manufacturers to find out who your local reps are. They're out there for a reason, and that is to help you and educate you so that you can become more knowledgeable on their products, which will then allow you to identify, diagnose, and be able to sell their products better. After listening to this episode, we hope that you feel more confident in in-floor systems so that you can answer any questions your customers may have. Well, without further ado, let's jump into the episode. Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Viafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. So I'm the regional sales manager here in Arizona and also cover Utah. Basically, what that means is I'm in charge of sales, and I also help with uh, technical stuff. I work here with uh, Gregory Huber, and we also have two other guys here locally as well. And uh, we just make sure our dealers understand the product, obviously try and get more dealers on the team. That can come from uh, helping with uh, installation, troubleshooting, obviously working with service and repair, such as uh, companies, um, you know, basically service companies in the Valley, making sure they understand it and uh, that they promote it. Okay. So... What do you like to do for fun? Just trying to get to know you guys a little bit more. Yeah, no worries. So first of all, I mean, I've got three kids. They all have different activities going on. I've got a 17, a 15, and a five-year-old. So it's kind of crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice expression. Big big difference. (laughs) Well, at least you got two two qualified babysitters though, right? That's correct. Yes. Well, yeah. Yes. How about qualified? Our sons, our sons, <laughs> our daughter graduated, is, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously certified with fire department, totally qualified hundred percent. Our son, you know, he's not as much of a babysitter, but yeah, no, other than Uber. hanging out with the kids and stuff. I mean, not really too much. I mean, honestly, I mean, I like movies and stuff and music and what kind of music? I like everything, honestly. I mean, I'm cause I'm driving my kids and stuff around. So our daughter, she's 15. So she's like, her name's Haley, so I call it Haley Music. So it's all the pop music and stuff. And you hear that stuff enough and it gets in your head. Oh, I don't yeah. know if I like it, but it sing it, which is kind of bad. It does the job. <laughs> Dude, I hate that like me and my kids, I mean, we're they're still too young, but we don't have the same music taste. So it's like when I think I'm like, oh, I love this when I was young, you know, like, you know, crisscross or something. And they're like, oh, <laughs> like this is no. Crisscross make me want to jump. Up jump. Baby shark. I know. <laughs> hey, yeah, baby dude. shark. Man, <laughs> All we listen to is soundtracks, like soundtracks oh, yeah. from freaking yes. movies. From all the movies. Disney. Yeah. Uh, if I hear Let It Go one more time, <laughs> I'm going to let it go. <laughs> we could at least listen go. to Drake, right? <laughs> what about you, Greg? You got five kids? What do you yeah. guys do? Um... <laughs> make kids yeah besides make kids <laughs> kids yeah, a lot of practice <laughs> yeah like <a> factory <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah anyway um no i've uh i've done almost every hobby there is out there <laughs> from fishing to flying airplanes to hunting i like my hobbies so done a lot of different stuff currently i was just uh, this weekend i was up north with a bow and arrow chasing deer around so oh nice yep. i would like my hobbies too if i had five kids yeah <laughs> yes honey i need, I need a amazing. break <laughs> yeah. it's like uh i'm out of here yeah she homeschools them also so it's like she does everything <laughs> homeschool wow. yeah plus she's a yeah. fantasy and football commissioner a, and she's a commissioner yes. Yes. Hey, oh, she's, i am in you that both? i got two yeah. you got, what's yeah. your screen name uh i think it's az vikes oh name. i thought that yeah. was you okay yeah yeah. I think hers is Beauty and the Beast mode. Oh, nice. So hers is yeah. uh, Pablo Escobar two one five. Cartel. That's awesome. And what's your role with the ANA? Um, same as Bushy, regional sales manager. I'm more Western Arizona, so we have Riley in the East Side. Um, so I cover a lot of our West Western builders and uh, do service calls with them. Uh, go out and if a customer has a complaint within that first two or three years that a builder gives a warranty, I'm going out there and and taking care of it. 
so that the builder doesn't have to. Basically, nice. what's your um, if I remember, I'll start with you. What is your background in the pool industry? Where did you get started in the pool industry? Oh, so um, my very first pool industry gig was actually I worked for SCP in Tucson when I was going to school at the University of Arizona. So I worked there for two summers. Later on, um, I started at uh, Polaris in 1999. So, and it's crazy because I actually got into the industry from my dad and my dad got into it from his dad. So our family has actually been in the industry uh, since like the late 50s. Oh, wow. Yeah. So my grandpa built uh, vinyl liner in-ground pools in Massachusetts. Later on, my dad actually got into the industry, worked for a manufacturer called Swimrite, which is based in Van Nuys, California. He worked for various manufacturers. And then I went to U of A. I went to, I worked at Xerox. Um, and then after Xerox, I ended up getting into the pool industry in 99. So I've been in the valley uh, in the pool industry for 20 years. Oh, wow. Everybody knows who you are. This is Scott Bushy. <laughs> <laughs> so you've seen a lot of changes over the years, I'm sure. Yeah, man, it's uh, I've seen quite a bit. So a lot of consolidation. Uh, more importantly, though, just cool technology, new stuff. Um, you know, variable speed technology is probably a huge one, I would say. And then just products that work with that. Um, just a lot of really cool, cool things. I'm I love innovation. Um, I just love seeing people come up with something, some new ideas, and especially in our industry, it's really exciting because a lot of times it starts with guys that were you know start as a pool service guy or a new pool builder, right? I mean, you guys got the podcast, obviously, right? I mean, this mm -hmm. is a big deal. It's an innovative thing. People are excited about it. So um, I just, I, that's, that's, that's what I get excited about with this industry is just seeing guys, girls, whatever, just start something and come up with an idea. I mean, a lot of really good ideas in the pool industry, though, started from guys that are just cleaning pools or whatever, you know? They're like, started because hey, they had a problem this? and they wanted to fix it. A hundred percent, you know? <laughs> yeah. And by the way, I mean, any industry, it's, it's pretty much the same thing, you know? Yeah, totally agree. What would you, you know, since 99 up to 2019, what do you think has been like kind of the, the golden era of that when it was like the best time for you? Um, so best time industry wide was probably, you know, obviously the boom, they would say. So probably, oh, like oh five, oh six ish, you know, before the recession. I mean, I'm sure you've heard in this valley, you know, we were doing 25 to 30,000 permits, 25 to 30,000 pools. I heard Every, that. Everybody was really busy, obviously. Um, it was really easy to get a loan. I mean, there were a lot of repercussions from that. But um, the, the main thing is, is uh, business-wise, that was good. Personally, um, in those 20 years, what I was most excited about was actually just starting in the industry. Um, and I was only 23. And so just learning something new. I mean, I'd been in, involved with my dad being in the industry and stuff, but just meeting new customers. And there were a lot of uh, companies in the Valley that aren't around anymore. And I've developed a lot of really good relationships. And I started those out probably in the next first couple of years. The company that I started with, you know, they were actually just creating a direct sales force. It was brand new. So it was like kind of like the, the cutting edge, like, okay, we're going to go from marketing reps to direct sales force. So I was like one of the very first salespeople for that company in the country. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun because it felt like, like, hey, we're going we're gonna to do something. This is going to be really cool. And we just kept building it and building it. And I learned just so much from so many people. And I'm quite grateful for it too. But during that time, I mean, just being young and just having fun. My wife and I were just starting our family. So it was a lot of fun. That's probably my favorite. That sounds cool. Who is a... A big kind of mentor for you? Big mentor. I mean, it's kind of cliche. I'd say part, part is probably my dad. Um, the reason he's probably a big mentor is because, like I said, he'd been in the industry since 73. And so just seeing all the relationships and stuff that he's developed. I mean, at the end of the day, being on a sales side, it's, I mean, it, it is about what you know, but it, I mean, again, cliche, but it's who you know, and it's extremely true. And, uh, and my dad, was really good at that. And so I looked at that. And at one time, he actually was my boss um, for a short time. But but I just, it's one of those things, you just, you understand how important it is to create those relationships and get to know these people on a personal basis. And uh, that's really why I like to do what I do. So so when it comes to a mentor, I mean, there's other people out there that are really good at, what, at that. Um, there's a guy, uh, Vance Gillette, 
you've probably heard his name a couple times. He's been in the industry quite a while, worked at Jandy. He was very, very good at, uh, he's written a lot of articles too about uh, keeping customers and the importance of loyalty and what you do when you lose a customer. Uh, many articles recently in the Pool and Spa News. That's, that's another thing. And then the other one is probably, you know, just previous, uh, the CEO, my first boss at Polaris actually was a national sales manager. Um, his name's Jeff Christine, really good guy. He is the one that kind of took a chance on me because I was 23, you know. I mean, these days for somebody to get hired in the industry that young and kind of just kind of say, hey, go ahead and just make it happen. It doesn't happen very often. Honestly, there's other, I think other mentors are probably just some of my customers I've met too, you know. Some purchasers and stuff from larger corporations that aren't around anymore. Um, you know, Paddock Pools, uh, they were here for years. They're a huge customer of mine. And uh, the purchaser there, just just a great guy. He'd been in other industries and stereo equipment business and stuff. And he was a purchaser for other industries. Um, but he really kind of took me under his wing and stuff. And I really got to understand how to deal with purchasers and stuff of dealers and, 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 and work with large corporations. So at that time, you know, that company, I mean, they had multiple divisions and stuff so being able to deal with those types of corporations and different divisions and how to ask the right questions and whatnot as well so you know what after hearing you say all of that i think salespeople have like a bad rep but i'm pretty proud of the pool industry because there's a lot of really good Absolutely. um sales that are actually extremely knowledgeable about products mm -hmm. and i don't think that um there's a lot of other industries that are um that good like if I want to go buy a Toyota Tundra, they're going to be really good at, you know, selling me the vehicle and kind of walking me through that process. But they're not as good at walking me through sort of the brass tacks of the technical pieces of the vehicle. And it's like talking with you guys, you know, you wouldn't have a problem, which that's what we're doing here today. You wouldn't have a problem in breaking down the module and telling the people, hey, this is what to look for. This is how it works. Here's some, you know, troubleshooting stuff. And I think never really thought about it that way, but you kind of inspired me to think a little bit differently about uh, salespeople in our industry. Cause yeah, there's some just like any other industry that aren't so great, but you know, we've been uh, really fortunate to be around a lot of salespeople that have been extremely knowledgeable. I mean, to the point where, I mean, they can go visit us in the field and, you know, figure out a problem for us. And isn't that what we all want? It's like you win, we win because we're figuring something out. And then you guys win because it's, dude, that's, we're going to use that stuff because we got, we got homies over there at ANA that are going to help us out when we get into a bind. And before you know it, you know, it's the expectation is for us to just, uh, at some point get it <laughs> and just know how to troubleshoot that and teach our team accordingly. Um, but all that stuff takes time. But I think that is something that is, uh, was really cool about our industry for sure what about you greg can you share with us how you kind of got into the industry yeah so uh it was summer i had just gotten out of kindergarten and uh <laughs> cannonballed into a I pool think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my uh my, i think my mom was working and didn't uh i couldn't stick around at the house so my dad's like hey you're coming to work with me and he did uh he did swimming pool layouts so spray paint them on the ground before you dig make sure all the measurements are correct because if it's not it could come back on you but uh so I would sit on the patio, watch him do that, and I would do a thing called making nails, where you take nails with flagging tape, punch it through, and tear it so they can space those out evenly around the pool, and just got to watch him do that. And then eventually, when I became 15, 16 years old, I started doing that myself uh, to make money for pay for a car and insurance and everything, and uh, and uh, it was a good way to make some money, for sure. Friends were working, making 10, or not even $10 an hour. Back then, what, 6 $7 an hour was minimum wage. When you and, were in uh, kindergarten? No, 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 no. Now, now I'm 15, 16. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah. cool. <laughs> Come on, shit, you have other <laughs> friends that are working? We 10 years. That's <laughs> <laughs> time warp. <laughs> Mom, damn. Yeah. No, so I'm, uh, I'm now older <laughs> and uh, have a vehicle, got to pay for the bills. So uh, doing layouts, making $50 a pop on those, doing a couple of them a day, fairly easy after school and uh, making good money. And That's it's fun. I love math. So yeah. anything like that where I can measure stuff and customers love it too you come out there and they have nothing in their backyard to now they get to see a visual representation representation of what the pool is going to look like and it's pretty cool 
Yeah, that until is cool. they say it looks too small every single time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you might say that. So there's another outline around this. That yeah, that's that's the size of it. So where uh, where are you from exactly? Are you from here? Um, I was born in Kentucky, and we moved here when I was one. So oh, okay, I know nothing else. So the stuff you were doing with your dad was here in Phoenix. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, all here in Phoenix. Yep, it's Phoenix summers working outside. Good oh. stuff. Okay, is your dad still doing that? Um, no, he no, so he start he actually started a company. At the time, he was working for someone, I believe, or working for a builder, and he started his own company, was doing layouts for a lot of the builders in the valley, and uh, had several people working for him, including me, and then um, the economy started to take a turn, so he had to kind of let everybody go and just focus on doing it himself. I went into a different industry for seven years and then came back to doing layouts and doing actually pool service for six months with a, a family friend, and uh, and then a and opportunity appeared, so nice, very nice. Oh, sure. Your dad works for NA too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he, exactly. He works there and he kept, he kept telling me, you need to come work here. I'm like, <laughs> I'm doing a good thing. I, I like what I'm doing. It's uh, it's not, uh, not the right time, but he's like, man, this is the products they have and that just everything's just really innovative and it's a great place to work. And I finally interviewed with a guy by the name of, uh, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch not of Greg's. my dad. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. But, Cause your dad's um, name is Greg yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I was like, is that all you hire over here or Greg? But, um, yeah, I have to change my name. Actually. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bushy. Uh, yeah. Bushy. <laughs> undergoing uh, name change. But uh, yeah, got the job and been there a little over three years now, I think. So. Nice. And what were you doing for those seven years? What other. Um, I worked at a packaging company. So basically like the, the show, the office, we sold boxes and bubble wrap Sweet. and paper. So, so did you work for Daryl then? Like, um, yeah, yeah. I worked, I did like, start in the warehouse. Did you? <laughs> started in the warehouse, moved into the office, ended up becoming, uh, actually the, uh, um, what's it called? Not chief financial officer, but like, uh, I don't know. I was in charge of the money. Basically I was overseeing AP accounts, payable and accounts receivable controller. Uh, controller. Correct. Yeah. Financial controller. Yeah. Awesome. And, uh, yeah, I think you would know if you're the CFO. Yeah. Yeah. That so like a pretty important deal. <laughs> I think I was the CFO. Yeah, something with some initials. I think I was like running the show. Yeah. I, was a ball. I don't know. Showed up when I wanted. No. <laughs> so the office is like our favorite show. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I've seen it dozens of times. Oh, insane amount. Uh, who's your favorite character? Oh gosh. A favorite character. Oh man. Um, so Robert difficult. California. Robert California. What? That's weird. I've never it? heard that. The Lizard King. <laughs> Dang. Dude, the Lizard King is. <laughs> he's, that is like, the most you know iconic he's line. He's such a weirdo. He is uh, just the biggest weirdo. Uh, and I, I don't know. It's, that actor in general is scares me. Let dude. alone. And I got hip to the blacklist <laughs> late. Like my wife's been watching it. And I can't even. I've never it's seen so it. It's so hard to watch. Because That's his show now. Is yeah. it good? I'm, it's really it, good. It's, it's hey, rough. super good, oh. but it's really weird because he's in the office oh, yeah. and now I can't even, it's, it's really difficult because I'm like this dude, he sells paper. So like, yeah. have you ever seen the movie less than zero? Uh-uh. That was like one of his first movies that Robert, I'm trying to think what the guy's name is, the actor, but, um, Robert California, <laughs> he was, he was in with Robert Downey Jr. Less than oh. zero. And he's that kind of just weird. I have yeah. to think that the dude is actually really smart. Like, I feel like to you be have to be to smart to even... Position. Yeah, to be able to, to play something like that. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's why I like it. Yeah. You just disappointed a lot of people with that answer. Yeah. Robert Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> they can deal with it. <laughs> like, not, not Kevin? Yeah. In a, in a, in a accounting? Oh, Jim. Everybody, Kevin. it's Jim, guys. <laughs> it's like, James Spader. James Spader. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Let's go. I thought it was Bobby. Jesus. Thanks, Sanders. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Wizard. <laughs> I don't know, who who's your favorite in the show? Man, I don't know. Didn't you say don't Oscar? Say Jim, Andy's one of my favorites. Andy, all right. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's been one of my favorite for a long time. Mine is for sure Dwight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Dwight Dwight's Schrute. a very close was, second. Yes. Very close. Yeah, Dwight's I was going to say Dwight. Yeah. yeah, my favorite episode is the uh, the fire drill. Oh, dude, yeah, oh yeah, dude. man! I mean, that uh, is, I oh, when it turns freaking cat in the sky. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sprinkles. <laughs> they're like falling out of the freaking roof yeah. like they're dude that is the best oscar's legs just dangling oh man <laughs> or when he fires off the gun in the office he finally gets the freaking job and he fires the gun off <laughs> and he's like i want to interview for the for the job position and she's like all right first question have you ever fired a gun in the office <laughs> he's like it's yeah complicated. it's complicated <laughs> it's actually not <laughs> oh dude daryl at the er he's off I just, uh, he's all acting like, uh, you couldn't hear Andy or whatever. Like, uh, 
in the ER. Do you remember that? Uh uh-uh, uh, in the ER? Yeah, okay. when he Daryl drives Andy to the emergency room and he's all acted like uh, I couldn't hear him. He goes, he just kept calling himself a gunshot victim and it drove me crazy. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that is so awesome. Dude, Daryl's funny as hell yeah. too. Yeah. Oh dude. He got funnier too as the show progressed oh, yeah. because they used him more. They were like, Oh, this guy's actually a pretty funny guy. Who, Daryl? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the first couple of seasons he's not in it too much. Oh, yeah. But then he like, yeah, this guy, this guy's super funny. When the whole warehouse wins the lottery. Oh, dude. And he's just like <laughs> sulking. And he's That's so one sad. of my favorite Robert California lines. I miss original. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. When he drinks the energy drink. Oh, dude. Just kidding. That's disgusting. That is. <laughs> dude. That is genius writing, though. For you to be able, like, 95% of that is like filmed in an office. Oh, yeah. To have it that entertaining is pretty freaking wild. But it is that is some of the most genius like stuff ever. I love trivia night. Trivia night is oh, the yeah, best. Night. When it's like the Einsteins. Yeah. <laughs> like there's but like nobody thinks that these guys are gonna win, but it's like a total <laughs> slumdog millionaire exactly. freaking. They try to mom- recreate it. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh Robotism. <laughs> Yeah, dude, that shit is. Jim's so facial expressions to me are are some of the funniest too. Oh yeah, they like, just show him his face like all he doesn't say anything, but just you just look at his face. And I love when one of his girlfriends before uh, Pam like called him out on it. She's like, "Why are you always making that?" Face? Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, it's, it's like every time something happens, you like make a face and look at the camera. I'm like, dude, that is so freaking awesome. That awesome. That. Yeah. yeah, I was watching something recently, and I guess B.J. Novak was started out as a writer. You know, Ryan. And that's the character. Yeah, writer. he has a big part yeah. of the writer. Him and and cool, used to write and, cool you know, hipster DK kid. Line, yeah. yeah. So, and I was, oh man, we were, I hate we were watching it recently because that's my daughter's favorite show, which thank goodness, you know, not besides that's pretty the cool. music thing, that's something we love, all love to watch. So I was like, it's a family thing, which, which pretty what, cool. The Office. Oh, really? Oh, Your family? Awesome. Heck yeah. Oh, yeah, dude. Because <laughs> all of her friends, so she's 15, and all of her friends, like, so. What? Yeah, so that yes. age group loved The Office, which is pretty I, I cool. remember, so I would sit in high school with my little iPad, or not iPad, iPod. I'm like, you, two inches I, tall. I only had iPad yeah, in high no, school, no, no. bro. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little one megabyte. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, it had a little screen on it, like a one-inch screen, and me and my buddy would sit there with headphones, and we just watched The Office, like season one and two, like in high school. It was so awesome. Yeah, I had that too. Like Dude. the, it was like this big of a screen. You can't yeah. see it on the audio, oh, the, but like, the like a two by two screen. Yeah. yeah. And he like watched office shows oh on it. God. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, that's my that idea of like around. ideal vacation is like, oh, just me in a room and like <laughs> terrible food and just <laughs> watch, watch office for like five days straight. Absolutely. Just, <laughs> Oh man! Oh man! The office is good stuff. It's awesome. So should we talk about some pool stuff? Oh yeah, yeah. All right. we're here for. <laughs> Dude, we're gonna do a completely separate podcast Robert? for the office. Robert California. Yeah, so can you do cool. it? Let's talk about the pool in a Robert California there voice. <laughs> yeah. Greg, you're up so... with that. <laughs> oh I don't man! Know my real name. <laughs> So, whoa, whoa, what's your favorite ice cream? You wouldn't be able to guess in a million years. <laughs> like, what? Oh, oh my gosh. Oh, that's so good. So, Jobber is constantly updating and adding new features to their software. That's one of the things we like most about them. As technology changes, so do our customers. We're happy that Jobber is always on top of it. And now for your update on what's new on Jobber. Ladies and gentlemen, and I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. So Jobber's made an awesome update, which allows you to schedule faster with the latest calendar updates. It will make it much easier for you to use the calendar and see who is assigned to the work. So if you've assigned calendar colors to your team, any assigned work for that person will now also have a map pin with a corresponding color and their initials. Your calendar colors will also show when you're assigning visits on the map view. They've also made it much easier to drill down to the details that you need. You can easily select who and what type of work you would like to see. So to check out this update in full, click the gear in the top right corner and click product updates. Or if you're not yet using Jobber, we encourage you to try it out. Go to getjobber.com forward slash pool chasers. That's getjobber.com forward slash pool chasers. All right, so let's jump into discussion regarding Infor systems here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of Infor systems? You know, most of the time, like we talked about earlier, somebody's trying to solve a problem, right? So they obviously saw something going on and then they decided to create Enforce systems. Do you guys know kind of how some of that got started? Yeah, man. So um, 
This is pretty interesting. So again, this is the innovation. This is the stuff that's pretty cool when it comes to uh, the pool industry. So back in the day, probably around uh, early 70s to mid 70s, there were a couple builders in the valley. And uh, one of them was uh, Shasta Pools. And Shasta Pools originally actually got uh, in-floor heads from a company called Swimquip based in Southern California in El Monte. They were getting those, uh, basically these heads, um, is, they're called turbo clean heads and they're stationary and they rotated on the inside of the head. So it would rotate around to obviously clean the pool. Before that, there was only water going to it. There really wasn't any sort of valve or anything like that. And um, around that time, they actually met up with a guy uh, his name was Dan Gould, who was actually an engineer from Boeing out of Washington. And he was down here, believe it or not, at a state fair. Can you believe that? And he had a sprinkler valve. And that was the whole concept. So if you think about it, a sprinkler system in, the, in your backyard, you've got different size nozzles and stuff, and you have a valve that would go to either, you know, your, your bushes or your lawn or whatnot. So it was the same concept they decided to put in a swimming pool. And they basically met up with this guy and said, hey, could you do that in an inch and a half pipe? Now, remember, this is in the 70s, so they weren't thinking about two inch or two and a half or anything like that. And when they were building pools, I mean, at one time they were using, you know, copper, flex line, all sorts of stuff. So, yeah. so he said, yeah, I could do that. So basically what ended up happening is they created the valve and they had the heads. And for years they had these two components with this company, Swimquip. And then eventually it was a revolutionary thing. They came up with the pop-up head. So the idea of it actually stationary and then popping up and then rotating using the valve to go and clean different positions. Sitting flush with the floor now. Yeah. So now we're sitting flush. And the whole reason for the in-floor was basically just a better way to move water, uh, getting the dirt off the floor and putting in suspension. So that's the key is pushing the dirt and putting it in suspension as opposed to, you know, having it just sit there. So previous to in-floor cleaning systems, cleaners, were pressure cleaners. So they were Arneson Pool Sweep was a very popular pool sweep. Uh, Polaris eventually. They even had whips. I don't know. Did you guys ever see that? I was going to bring up whips. I was like, dude, yeah. the whips things, I've seen that like one time. Yeah. I mean, I've seen them on the walls like where they took them out, but like yeah. actually in action. Yeah. I think it's pretty weird. It is. Yeah. <laughs> and that was the idea, right? They're just, all they're doing is they're trying to figure out a way to push stuff around. And more importantly, you know, I think here in Arizona, we have a lot of dirt, obviously, and dust. So that was the idea of moving all that around. And the big thing from talking to some folks, the reason they did it is, is people were bringing in these cleaners and stuff and they were complaining about repairs and stuff. And, and the whole tagline is they want people to enjoy their pool and not, in, not endure it. So basically having not to bring their cleaner in and get it fixed all the time, being able to enjoy it and, uh, and at the same time having them pop up and down. Because initially when the heads were stationary and stuff, they might have been kind of protruding so they're a little bit a nuisance so to speak so the company decided hey let's let's make it so they rotate up and down instead of obviously stay uh up all the time i didn't know that they ever stayed up all the time when you they first were installed the, the they just they just stayed no turbos that's yeah. what they used to call them no yeah yeah. Yeah. yeah so they uh the turbos they sat up about half an inch to three quarters of an inch i think above finish mm -hmm. and they had holes i think i want to say 18 of them around the outside and they're about six inches in diameter so you just blew water and, and out in every came, direction. As, no, as it came up, it selected one of the channels. Oh, and go. So it, it came up, came up and down, but it was all internal. Hmm. You didn't see it. So, wow. So, so in the beginning, it was more for like the circulation and just to put um, the dust and different things like that into suspension, so that it could be filtered, opposed to um, like pushing everything to the main drain. It's actually the... still. To this day, it's, it's that is a part of it's, it. It's mostly, yeah, it's it's getting stuff in suspension, and then through running that pool for several hours, you're getting everything to the drain and getting it filtered with fresh water coming back to the pool. So very good. That's a cool history yeah, uh, on that, and uh, a lot of that. So I'm assuming most of that started here in yeah. in Arizona. Absolutely, yeah. Everything here was in Arizona. So all the in-floor cleaning manufacturers are all based of based out of Arizona and started here. So it must have been a lot of dust. <laughs> <laughs> did you see um did you see issues in the very beginning of people building brand new pools with in-floor systems and they weren't installed properly therefore um, the system wasn't working properly because we were talking quite a bit about this that a product might be 
really well designed and work really well, but if it's not installed properly from the manufacturer's spec, it's just not going to work correctly. Did you see a lot of that in the beginning? Yeah, I mean, uh, basically, you know, Greg and I were talking about it. So back in the day versus now is the plumbers, right? So the plumbers are the ones that are installing the M4 cleaning systems and stuff. They were kind of setting the heads up. So the turbo clean system was actually kind of installed almost like in a line. You have to remember pools, they didn't have a lot of free form, very geometric, very, you know, basically, you know, straight lines. So we didn't have to worry about these curves and grottos. I mean, pools have come so far now from where they used to be, you know, it was really just, Hey, I just build me a, you know, dig me a hole so I can get wet and I'm going to have this, you know, 20 by 40 or 15 by 30 pool. And that was that. So obviously as things changed and you have Baja shelves and you have all that, it's more important to put the heads where they need to go with our system. Basically the builder actually sends in a plan. They send in a sheet that actually asks them questions such as, you know, where the, how far the drain is from the equipment, the skimmer, so hydraulics questions to really understand, you know, make sure that we don't have head loss. Um, and then we spec out based on the pump, the filter, how far away it is from the pool, which heads need to be on the bottom, where they need to be, where they need to be on the steps. So we have a nice clean pool. So and back in the day, obviously, they didn't have any of that kind of stuff as much as they do now. Right. I would think that there's a lot of residential pools now that might have been more of like a commercial pool, even just 20 years ago, because now we have multiple skimmers, maybe multiple drains. We have a lot of different things going on on residential pools that is just it's just not the same as it probably was. Yeah, I, th I think what, what I've seen is, is with builders is their huge influence now is, is people going on vacation because they go to these resorts in Hawaii and all over and they see these water slides and water parks and they're like, oh, that's what I want in my backyard. You know, it's like, holy cow, you know, and sometimes they have it in their backyard, which is amazing. So that's something obviously they never <laughs> You got the money. Right. We can, uh, Dude, we we can, can make it happen. It. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you build it, they will come. You <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what all like the parents think. If you build it, like you know, our house will be the hangout place, exactly, yeah. and they'll yeah, come hang out. Deal. Depends on how old, how old the kids are, because they're yeah. like, yeah, we want to hang out here. We just don't want you here. So <laughs> go yeah. on vacation, so we can have the next rager here. But even then, though, at least like <laughs> yeah, if no, you're in the I'm house, kidding. like at least they're at your house and not you know some other kid's house. As long as you have good insurance, I'm not building yeah. my badass pool until kids are like <laughs> like late twenties. You know, get, get out of their system. So what happened, Dad? Yeah. Why did you have this cool pool? You, we had this spool our whole life. <laughs> this little eight thousand gallon L shaped <laughs> spool you have Above here. Ground. <laughs> <laughs> Pool's dusty. When people are first starting out, you know, in the industry or just aren't super familiar with in floor systems, when they're going into a backyard like on a pool service bid or something, what are some of the indicators that the pool uses an in-floor system? What are, we, what are you looking for to tell? So the first thing you're going to look for is pop-up heads in the bottom of the pool. So there's got to be something to return water uh, to the swimming pool. And uh, if there's some of the pools won't have return lines, some of the older pools, and they'll just have pop-up heads. But uh, if there's no vacuum and you see circles at the bottom of the pool and on the steps, then you're, you're looking at an in-floor pool there. And there's going to be a water valve somewhere that controls it. That's going to be something you're going to want to check out for sure. Where are and those usually placed? So there's two places you can place the water valve. One is equipment side, so right by the pump and filter. The other one's pool side. If you place it pool side, it's kind of nicer because you're running one pipe from the filter to the pool and then six pipes or five pipes, a short distance, short run to the heads. Now, the back downside to that is you have your water valve at the pool, so you got to try to cover it, hide it, keep it down low. People, I've seen them buried under six inches of rock, and I'm digging around trying to find them. But, uh, but it is a more efficient uh, plumbing setup to have them out there. Yeah. Well, when they first started doing, they were digging them way deep, man. I, I mean, I've dug. Yeah, you're like six feet deep trying to find these things. How are you supposed to replace these gears when they're <laughs> six feet underground? Brutal. But now you'll see them under like what faux rock and like yeah, a little irrigation box irrigation boxes yeah. and other places. But I do have seen them. Those are really hard to diagnose, you know, when you're walking in the backyard and someone's like, my pop assistants aren't working and you like can't find the valve. I, I, I had someone <laughs> ask that recently. How do you find it? I'm like, that's a good question. I'm like, look around, but listen for that one time sound there's, there's a valve <laughs> underneath the barbecue area. So like where the door opens for, oh, you know, wow. access, they put it there. Oh man. <laughs> Next to the propane tank. Like, how would you find that? if you Dude, didn't... we've seen them, uh, everywhere, everything from they've built a new wall on the property 
and the modules behind the wall. We've seen it, you know, there's huge like like shrubs, bushes, and it's way behind it. And you're like lifting up the bushes to like find it. And it's like, oh, like there it is. And that was much more unfortunate for us if we were trying to clear a screen on caretaker system or something like that. And that's something they kind of have to do more regularly. And it's like swimming through these bushes, which is something I don't really like doing because I don't know what's in those bushes. So what is a what is the plumbing uh, setup kind of look like if you have a pop up system? What are you looking at when you're looking at the equipment set? It looks differently than a vacuum system. So would. usually what you'll see is just a uh, the last line on the header will say cleaning system or in floor system, and that's going to the water valve. Um, what you'll see on some older systems, I think they're caretaker systems, is you'll see another line that's a bypass, and that's in case the uh, the water valve deadheads. There's a check valve there that diverts pressure around so that the pump's still able to function and not uh, not explode. Cool. Can you explain how the systems or in-floor systems are designed to work? Like you talked about earlier being yeah, in suspension. So, but yeah, so what? cleaning through suspension is huge. That's uh, We're trying to get that dust uh, debris up in suspension. And in the early days when drains were just waffle-shaped or couldn't take in heavy debris, that was the only thing they could do. Get stuff in suspension and get that stuff to the filter. Now with heavy debris removal drains where we have big gaps around there, we can take in leaves. Uh, we're seeing good success with putting these in Texas and across the across the nation now with uh, Infor systems. So they're able to take in much larger debris than they were before and keep a pool a lot cleaner than they ever have. So how is the valve supposed to work though? Like, so if the water's flowing back to the pool, right? And you've, I have no idea what I've oh, yeah, ever yeah. seen one before. Can you explain how yeah, that works? So the, the water valve selects a station or a bank of heads to come up. So the water's all coming from the pump going to this valve. And then the valve's like a diverter. It selects a group of anywhere from two to I've seen up to 10 heads pop up at a time. And then it rotates to the next station. And usually you see a 30 to 60 second time and transition there changing through the zones. And then it usually has five or six stations that select that come through or whatever. And then, yeah, that's basically it. Like I think with your um, low profile one, you can actually change how long in between rotations. Right? Yeah. So d different valves have different ways of uh, speeding up or slowing down the water that comes in. Um, some are electronic. Ours happen to be uh, mechanical, where if you rotate the lid uh, counterclockwise, you're going to get that valve transitioning quicker. If you rotate it all the way clockwise, it's going to slow it down. So it's not giving less or more water to the heads themselves. They're always getting the same amount of pressure. It's just slowing down the gear kit or speeding it up so that you get a quicker transition between zones. And why would you want to do either one of those? So dirt takes a while to push. Believe it or not, we've done, I, I work with our R&D department uh, occasionally, and uh, we've done tests where we just literally throw dirt into a pool, a good amount of dirt, like a gallon or so, and uh, watch a cleaning head clean. And it takes a while for it to push it out into its optimal cleaning spot. So if it's just coming up for 15, 20 seconds, it's not cleaning more than several feet. I mean, it takes a while to push stuff out. It's not uh, with the resistance and water, it's taking longer to move move uh, debris. So Pretty heavy, and you don't want that sand, especially sand, just sitting in one place for... Correct, correct. If your pH gets high, and if you have dirt sitting there, you're asking for stains. So you're saying if your pool gets a lot more dirt in it, basically you want to set it to run slower you know, times it, in between it right? depends on head spacing mostly uh, i kind of set them in the middle and then i'll tune it appropriately and like i said it's usually a time thing 45 seconds to a minute is is what you're looking for between heads the way i time it too because it's hard to tell is the head all the way up when do i start the timer i wait till the group of heads drops so when you see it hit the ground you can start a timer and then you wait till the next set of heads that are currently up as soon as they drop that's kind of your peak to peak so you can try to time it to see how long it's taken very so cool. that, that's one of my diagnostic diagnostic things. When I go out there, I'll time the heads going between stations and make sure it's not uh, not too slow and not too quick. Kind yeah. of fine tuning things. That's a really good tip. I never thought about that. That's really cool. So I've heard several things, several different ways. Of this, if you're um, looking at a pool and there's pool returns, right? Some people think you should point them up. Some people think you should point them down. You know, sometimes when the heads are installed, or if you take over a pool that let's say you, you've never seen it before, but they have heads, right? So sometimes they're not shooting in the right direction. Is there a specific way that people should angle returns or is there a specific way the heads should be shooting water to so work together? 99% of the time, we want the return line closed. We want most of the water going to the in-floor system. Uh, the heads, the water to take the path of least resistance. If you have the return line open, 
the water comes up to that three-way T and it goes, all right, I can go through these little openings and a water valve and all this stuff, or I can go straight through an inch and a half inch line all the way straight to the pool. That's easier. Let's go that way. So you take away a lot of the cleaning pressure from the heads. I can't tell you how many calls I've been on where the enforce system is not working and it's just because of a return line open. So keeping that closed is huge. And then what, what was the other part of the question? Just kind of how you, how should you put the heads in which direction? Oh, yes, yes. No, know, so that's they uh, always change every time so, somebody steps on it. And yeah, then and, and the I've been out to pools where someone's taken the time to face every single head in the exact same direction. They're all going to the right. And I'm like, wow, that took some time. But as soon as you turn this pool off and back on, that zone that it's on is now going to be one step ahead of all the rest of them. And over time, they're just it's, it's just chaos. It just it's it works through getting everything up in suspension, not necessarily pointing it directly at the drain. So, so it doesn't matter too much which direction it, it, that so water's flowing. It doesn't matter as far as all six of the, all the heads in the swimming pool. If you have a certain shell for something where heads are coming up and the two heads that are coming up at the same time are pointed towards each other, there may be some conflict there and you could rotate one of the heads 180. And as long as they're on the same station, they're coming up and down at the same time, they're going to work better. They're going to they're going to clean better. But uh, but as far as different zones, so you're you talking like on steps and benches, steps and benches or the they... floor. If you have a group on the floor that the heads are coming up at the exact same time and they're fighting each other, rotate one of those bad boys down over 180 degrees. So, I mean, if you're turning off the returns, doesn't the returns actually help at that part of the pool and putting it into suspension kicking it to another direction of the pool so the in keeping it in suspension yeah no no it does. and and with pools that have vacuums i've seen that where people point them up and they try to create like a whirlpool effect so it's going towards the skimmer um with nowadays and having multiple skimmers and just different things the gallons per minute that we're flowing that we need at the cleaning heads is anywhere from 50 to 70 or so and it's going to move a ton of water you're gonna get everything in suspension everything pushed up towards the skimmer it's not necessary to have the returns open, like I said, 99% of the time. Yeah, and the big thing with Infloor, too, is you're moving chemically and, you know, filtered water. So you're moving chemically treated water and you're moving filtered water. And you're also heating from the bottom as well. So it actually does a better job efficiently as far as keeping the pool warmer. So, um, and the Infloor cleaning system, as I mentioned before, as far as sending in the sheet and the plan and all that, basically when we design that we design that with the returns off unless there's a specific thing so like they say i'll give an example this comes up sometimes where it's a pool spa combination and they want to have the spillover running the whole time because there's a certain amount of water that's required in order to get over that weir of the of the spa and so if that's the case then they would say i need you know 15 gallons a minute or something like that so we'll take that into consideration do the math and then figure out you know approximately how many heads and and you know how many valves, whatever, as far as setting it all up. So, but most of the time your returns are off and it's all going to the infloor cleaning system. And it really does a much better job on having all those heads up. And that was the huge benefit of having the infloor cleaning system. How it all started out is instead of having, you know, two or three returns on the, on the top, now you have, you know, seven, eight, nine, you know, however many, uh, initially on the floor. And now, you know, most, just to give you an idea, here in Arizona, an average in-floor system is probably around 16 to 18 heads for a full cleaning system, you know, based on the average pools and stuff these days. Um, certain areas are more or less, just depends on the size of the pool. You know, the resort pools, obviously, you're going to have, you know, sometimes 65, 70. So. It turns into a big mixing bowl. You get better chemical distribution, heat distribution, everything, compared to just the, the few return lines coming in 18 inches below surface. So. Right. So if you're closing off the returns, though, what I mean, what I would see is you you see that PSI climb quite high, right? Correct. Yeah, that's where the variable speed pump comes into into play a lot, because you can usually drop the RPMs. If it's not, you can try to bleed off some excess pressure through the return lines if you need to. Um, but uh, but yeah, generally we want to send all that water to the to the pop up heads. What happens if the the gears stop or is there if there's a bypass on it or how does that because wouldn't that create back pressure then right if it's like with, one of the one with, of the ports closes or it, with ANA specifically gears, or just I don't know just, just specifically if, so if, not ANA specifically so by having the returns closed now you're forcing all the water through the water valve and if there is an issue there uh, hopefully there's a safety feature be built in like the caretaker has the bypass and uh, with the ANA ones we don't they it's very difficult for them to completely stop and deadhead water flow. So yeah, it's basically designed to, to not deadhead is really what it comes down to. So whereas uh, other valves and stuff have other things that are installed in order to, you know, obviously not have a deadhead or if it does deadhead, what this is what will happen. So, but the problem is, is if you put more things sometimes on a system, now you're relying on that to save something else. So if it's originally designed in this case where, you know, we're not going to have any issues with deadheading, it's, you're in a better position. Right. 
my role at Brothers was I did the initial pool service bids. Want to be able to explain to people like what you do when you're seeing this pool for the very first time and you notice that there's an in-floor system. What do I do? What is my checklist? What am I doing at this point in time? It's okay. Let's turn the equipment on. Okay. They're, the pop-up heads are starting over here on the steps and they're moving like, can you guys walk us through, like, what does that checklist look like and what you need to be looking for? Yeah. So basically, uh, to troubleshoot an in-floor system, it, it can seem overwhelming and complicated, but there's really only three things that can be wrong. Physical issue with the cleaning head where it's broken, a physical issue with the water valve where something's broken there, or water flow, if they're not getting enough water flow to the water valve or heads. So it all comes down to those three things. So if you're looking at a pool to check and make sure the heads are functioning, are they recessing all the way and then extending all the way? And the way you would tell if they're extending all the way is just kind of look for a spray pattern or make sure they seem to be moving dirt. And then as long as they're rotating stations, you're getting one group of heads coming up. It's transitioning to the next group, transitioning to the next group in a timely manner, 30 to 60 seconds or so. Then uh, Is that usually what it is? Yeah, it could be longer. It could be up to two minutes or so for uh, other systems. But um, yeah, generally 30 to 60 seconds is what you're looking for. Is it usually about 30 or 60 seconds for an ANA system? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, if it, if it's over if it's longer than 2 minutes with an ANA system there's something wrong. Okay. There's something wrong with the gear kit, correct? Okay. So after so, you're so, kind of turning it on, you're timing it to see if they're doing what they're supposed to. Yeah. What are we yeah, doing? Yeah, so next? if they're rotating zones, then you know the water valves working properly. If the heads are retracting and extending, then you know the heads are working properly. Now just to make sure they're getting enough flow, we actually have a uh, a pressure tester that I'll plug in. I'll take out the top step head, whatever one's easiest to match the nozzle size and plug in a pressure tester that has a gauge on it. A lot of uh, water valves have pressure gauges on them, but that's only telling you the water pressure at that one point. If we can check it at the cleaning heads, you're getting, you're eliminating any other variable there may be, and you can watch the pressure. And most cleaning heads, almost every single one out there wants to be at 10 PSI. So if you have 10 PSI at your cleaning heads, they're going to be cleaning optimally. Okay. And that should be the same PSI throughout all the heads. It's correct. Usually when you test one, so when I plug it into that top step, whatever one's easiest to get to that zone should be balanced GPM wise within several GPM of, uh, of all the different stations. So as long as they're balanced, I can check it here and know that all six stations are going to be within half a pound or a pound of each other. Well, what if one station has two heads on it and the other one has like four? So if one has four, it most likely has smaller orifice openings. And the one that has two has larger to balance the GPM. Now, if the orifices have popped out or if uh, if it's gotten tweaked in some way, then you can watch pressure at the water valve, watch pressure at the filter and see. Because you'll notice, I don't know if you guys have seen that on a filter, when the water valve's rotating, you're not getting consistent pressure. The pressure fluctuates five pounds or so. So you can watch that and you can time zones that way to see how long they're taking to rotate. You can also look and see if there's a big fluctuation, like it's going from 25 to 28, 25, 28. Then it goes down to 20. You're like, oh, there must be less restriction on that. So the cleaning heads may have too big of an opening. There's just a few different things, kind of tips you can look for there. And that pressure piece that you're saying you put in the step, can people buy that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's an item that we have. Uh, we have it available for all ANA heads for the Style 1, Style 2, and the G4. Um, you plug it in there, and it comes with a pressure gauge and a couple different nozzles so you can match whatever head you're replacing there. I have some for competitors that I've made just in our machine shop, so I can plug it in and test other heads too. But um, but those aren't available for sale. Right. That's really cool. I've never heard of that before. But so I think one of the big things too is when we were out there, we knew that there might have been an issue because uh, we did a filter clean and the filter clean had been done. And if it's a cartridge filter, um, cartridges look good, everything's good, but we're still having some issues. Um, with the in floor system, what is the best um, for just this particular topic? What's the best way to identify what the heads are, like the model number and what that is, and what is the uh, best way to identify the actual module? Because that is a really difficult thing because it's like, I know there's an issue here, but I don't know how where's the information, you know what I mean? Because that's so that I want to touch base real quick on your first question. The first thing you said was there's an issue. The pool's not cleaning. If it's a specific spot, it's not cleaning like a certain zone of the pool. Now I'm checking the heads that are right around there. So I'm pulling them out looking. I've seen rocks and nozzles all the time where a certain part of a cool pool is not cleaning. And oh, it's just that we removed that boom. We're good to go. Now, if the entire pool is fairly dirty, now we're looking at a water flow issue or some, some other way than just the individual cleaning head. There's some, something going on there. Right. So then, and there's so many different issues, everything from 
like uh, a head won't even stay in there. It'll go sideways. And then before you know it, it pops out completely. You're by the gear set and it's making all these crazy noises. And you know that that is not normal for it to be making those noises. <laughs> right. So, you know, especially if you're kind of going through. Sound like a motorcycle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, how do I identify that? You know, it's like getting photos of this, getting photos of that. Um, so we'll start with photos. What is, what are the photos that you would want your technician in the field or what photos would you as a professional doing the service bid? What photos do you want exactly? So, um, so for our products, um, it's, it's fairly simple. We've got the top of the head. So the style one head has two prongs. So if they took a picture of the top and they saw the two prongs, there's a tool that only had literally has two prongs. That would be a style one head. A uh, style two head has three prongs, so that would be a style style two head. Um, and the final one is a G4. It used to be called the G3, um, but it's now the G4. And that basically has like a slot on each side, and that would be a tool for that. But you would take a picture of the top, and you could see visually what that is. And then we also have um, our Venturi heads now, which actually have tiny holes on the top. And those are basically use the G4 tool, but that would be a different type of head so it doesn't have adjustable nozzles that you would you, you adjust in the head itself it actually has only it's it's basically only has one opening because it uses venturi technology to clean which is super awesome yeah yeah <laughs> just like in skimmers <laughs> and uh yeah. so for the water valve just a picture of the water valve yeah and uh and from the outside base we can generally tell what it is now there's different water valves balls and flaps and that we got to kind of open it up most of the time to tell and there's different ports too right like five port six port four mm -hmm. port two port like Should you be counting the plumbing lines that surround it? Does that do anything so that you can tell if it's a six port, four port? Yeah. I mean, obviously when it's in the barbecue door or something like that, sometimes they're harder to see like we talked about, or it's, you know, it's really far down. Um, but yeah, just taking a picture, obviously with, with the low pro valve, it's either a two inch or inch and a half, but there's only six lines. Um, the top feed has either a six or a five. And normally, if it's a top feed valve on the older A and A valves, the way it's uh, plumbed, you should be able to see the bottom if it's a five or six ports coming on the bottom. That's really important to know if you're replacing gear sets. Hundred percent, big time. <laughs> because for the most part, you know, the you're running into issues because this is an older system, but it can still be repaired because there are still parts that can um, that you can buy from the distribution to replace it. So it's taking these photos, and once you have the photos. Where are we going to find information about this product in particular? I mean, is there is there a part number anywhere on these things or are we going on your guys' website? Especially if it's older, like where is that archive that we that we're finding this information? It's in our catalog. It's on our website, aamfg.com. Obviously, if you go to a distributor and stuff, most of them have uh, obviously the parts catalogs that literally, I think that's the second or third page. It actually has the evolution of all of the heads from the style one to where we are now oh, when nice. it came out. And you, so you can see kind of which one is what. Obviously, the other thing is, is with the in-floor heads is colors. So sometimes there's some confusion on whether it's a light gray or just a gray. A lot of times the gray will fade, so it's a matter of sometimes looking at the other heads. I always recommend kind of looking on the floor and then looking on the step. Do you see a huge variation? Um, and that that's most of the time, though, if you get a light gray because it does obviously lighten up over time, you're probably safe as opposed to the dark gray or just a gray by itself. Right, right. Are they all, are they all about the same size, the heads, or are they all different sizes? Yeah, so they all fit into uh, into two-inch pipe. And we have a riser for that. And then, uh, yeah, so they're all about the same size. Yeah, the uh, the original style ones, I believe, were inch and a half. But um, but they're still about two inches and two and a half inches in diameter. They're not. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And say somebody wanted to just replace kind of like everything. They just wanted to like, man, I want this to work the very best that it can. And I already have like an older ANA system. What is for an older ANA system, I guess, what is the best way to like upgrade that? Can you put a new sort of module and heads that are just going to do better? Yeah. So, well, with, uh, with just upgrading in general, when people replace one head at a time because they're starting to break, every month or so you're having a broken head in a dirty mm -hmm. pool. So for a year or two, until all those heads get replaced, you're dealing with a dirty pool. If you can just replace them all at the same time, it's more expensive, obviously, but you're going to be so much happier 
you're getting this pool back to brand new condition as far as the cleaning system goes. And it's just, uh, it's going to be a much, much better service experience and homeowner experience. Yeah. And they're all the same color too. And I'm sure there's Correct. a lot more, yeah, there's a lot more benefits. I'm sure, uh, cause I'm sure some of the tools that are used to kind of make adjustments on these are probably a lot more updated, just going to make it much easier. And we'll, I'm sure we're going to get much more into that, uh, down the road on this. Since we've started with Pool Chasers, we've spoken with a lot of pool builders and designers. Something they have all mentioned is that having realistic, detailed 3D renderings to show their clients is a game changer. Something that makes the rendering come to life is including products and accessories that your clients can purchase from you. One manufacturer that makes this particularly easy is Ledge Lounger. By going to ledgeloungers.com slash CAD, you can instantly download a 3D file for any product in their catalog. Everything from their signature chase to their new patio furniture, cabanas, games is all available to drop into your 3D designs. We've seen these renderings pop up on Instagram full of in-pool and outdoor furniture, and you can't help but stop and look. If you want to transform your 3D renderings, whether you use CAD, Pool Studio, SketchUp, or any other platform, you can get the product files you need at ledgeloungers.com slash CAD. That's ledgeloungers.com slash CAD, C-A-D. Um, but we want to jump into, you know, the main drain and kind of, you know, some different setups. How important is the type of main drain and what's the ideal valve setup between main drain and the skimmer? So the main drain's huge. If, uh, if you don't have a heavy debris removal drain, the pool is now just able to clean dust and any of the heavier stuff. Sand, you might get it cleaned up, but leaves, anything like that, it's just going to gather around the drain. It's going to look like Gia Pets down there. So uh, until, <laughs> you, <laughs> until you have a heavy debris removal drain, Infloor was kind of ahead of its time. Like when the pop-up heads were there, they were moving stuff. But until we had a drain that could actually take in heavy debris like we do now, and that's uh, compliant with all the current codes, it's it works pretty great. Just keep your net over the drain and it's like, all right, turn the system off. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. As just it all, all floats. Yeah. yeah it just all <laughs> shoots up. What plays a huge part into the main drain too is the skimmer. If, uh, if you have a skimmer, the skimmer can actually complement the drain in that if it's a Venturi skimmer, now you can pull more suction from the drain, removing more debris. And, uh, especially with the heavy debris removal drain, it just creates a, a very nice experience. Yeah. And that's what we've been talking about. We try to have things explained as if somebody's just you know, being introduced to the pool industry and they have no idea how any of this works. And there's a lot of professionals like ourselves that, you know, we didn't fully 100% understand how these things work. But the idea is to not only put um, a lot of the dirt and debris into suspension, but it's also to push everything and make its way to the main drain. And there's so many different shapes and sizes of pools that, you know, eventually it's going to get to the main drain. And if it gets to the main drain, we're trying to have, you know, the best main drain that the pool can possibly have so they can actually suck up this dust and de debris to be filtered or back to the pump basket or whatever it may be. Yeah, it's great if the heads move stuff around, but if they're making it to the drain and then just getting stuck there, it's, and you still have to net it or vacuum it out. What, yeah. And we have the Chia Pet. And <laughs> yeah, it gets exactly. staining if you have, just you know, wrong Chia. pH. And that sure. always um, kind of confused me a little bit. Because we had, in the beginning, the first couple of years, we had a lot of swimming pools that had older um, main drains. And I just could not wrap my head around how anything could get through that main drain. I'm like, it just doesn't seem like much could get through there. I mean, it's like a leaf just get, and it just would smack to it. <laughs> I mean, it's like it's yep. the... Uh, you know, the cuts in the main drain, like a leaf could get through there, but that's if it was precisely guided, guided in there. And it's not, <laughs> it's usually going to make its way and just smack on it yeah, flat. Right. So that was always, but then you start seeing these, um, the newer pools being built with these, you know, just crazy, um, uh, main drains that can actually like take in some of that, uh, debris and they're actually safer. Correct. Yeah, that, that's the another feature too is the drains. Yeah, they're classified unblockable as far as the ABSC channel drain that we have. That's a great replacement if you're remodeling a pool and you have you have in-floor heads, but you've always had issues with the drains clogging. But if you're going to go chip it out, get a different drain in there. Get a heavy debris removal drain, please. For sure. Yeah. What percentage, though, usually you want the valve set between main drain and skimmer? So that, that goes back to Besides, the... If you don't have a yeah, Venturi. If you don't have a Venturi, every pool is different. You got to play with it. It's... uh. I like to see a lot down there. 
at the drain, but if you can't remove the debris that uh, that you want to, then you got to kind of, if you're getting a lot of surface debris, get that skimmer rock in. If you're, now the thing is, if you go too much skimmer, you're getting dirt and dust sent at the bottom of the pool. So you got to kind of split them 50, 50 and just figure it tweak, out, tweak it from time. there. Every pool is going to be different. Yeah. That's what, yeah. That's, that's what, the that's most what. difficult thing is like truly every pool and its surroundings and where, you know, the elements, uh, during monsoon season, those pools might need adjustment. If you're yeah, yeah. Uh, a real professional and you really understand how a pool works and you know how the pools on your route or pools that you own work, you know that, okay, when I get into monsoon season, like I got to, I got to turn that valve just a little bit more to the, to the main drain side, uh, away from the skimmer side and it's going to do that much better. But once things kind of, uh, you know, clear up, we get through monsoon season, I can put it back to its original, uh, valve placement. Yeah. It's not just set it and forget it. Yeah, exactly. I always recommend taking a picture of where the valve is set yes. before you start uh, messing with it. I have a, I have a <laughs> black and a silver Sharpie I carry in my bag. Yeah, that's good too. Yeah. <laughs> before we get further, I want to go back to the diagnosing thing real quick about with flow because I wanted to – when we used to talk a lot about in-floor systems, we used to – talk about the filter clean, right? Because sometimes you don't know when the last time the filter was cleaned or the homeowner will lie about it. That's just why we always decided when we take on a no, new account, <laughs> when we take on a new account, the first thing we're going to do is a filter clean because that way we can actually diagnose the system properly. Because if you don't know there's proper flow, it's hard to say what's wrong with you know an in-floor system. So we used to always make sure we clean the filter first before we would ever tell the customer you need to replace all these heads, you need to replace all these gears because you're talking about thousands of dollars sometimes at that point. And, you know, we learned the hard way in charging people for stuff that didn't really need to be replaced. And all you could really do is a filter clean and then the whole pool worked. So that's just a piece of advice is to kind of yeah. try to solve that flow issue before you start telling the customer they need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah, definitely make sure filters are clean. That's on, yeah. Yeah. Either return line open, filter clean. Those are the two biggest service calls that I go out on. So yeah, and, I was on a job last week and I mean, this pool was only like two or three months old and we person didn't have unfortunately they didn't have any landscaping at all they had a giant thing of dirt it must have been like eight ten feet high it was just ridiculous and uh the filters were just destroyed i mean it had to be cleaned and everything and the thing was only two months old so that's the thing especially here in arizona with our storms and stuff you definitely got to be a little bit more diligent when it comes to cleaning those filters but you're absolutely 100 percent correct you got to start with a clean filter whenever you're diagnosing yeah. And I think, you know, we got to a point where we didn't care what they said. It's just a part of our plan because they would say, no, I just, my husband just did it. Or I just had somebody do that. And it got to the point where like, that's, we had a better way of saying this, but it, that's awesome. But like we're professionals and we're going to go in there and we're going to be checking the manifold. We're going to be checking this. We're going to be lubing up this. We're checking the bands on the cartridges. We're making sure that, you know, the grids got put back together correctly. We're making sure that, you know, these ribs aren't broken. Mm -hmm. I'm sure your husband didn't do all that and doesn't know how to do that. You know, I'm sure he's good at what he does, but like we're professionals at, you know, swimming pool stuff. And once we do that, um, everything can start, you know, working again. And if it's not that, maybe there's a slight clog in the line and you can put a flush bag in and push a little something out. You don't really know, but usually from our experience, the filter clean has really um, freed up a lot of um, a lot of stuff because you really don't have any idea what's going on in there. Yeah, people don't realize how important that is, filter clean. Yeah, that is, Big deal. That Big is deal. major. We always, towards the end, it was just 100%. Like if you weren't doing that, well, it's you're not even just in floors with everything, with a vacuum system, with, you know, an, uh, a variable speed pump, like the settings on it, like all of that is way better to do after you have a clean filter. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I say, that 10 pounds of pressure, that's, yeah, that's as your filters get dirtier, your cleaning heads are getting less and less pressure, eight, right. seven, six. And uh, yeah, people will look at their pool and see a ton of dirt in there. And then the next day it's clean, either from the vacuum or the in floor. All that stuff went into your filter. All right. that dirt that's now collected on the cartridges, your whole pool surface area is now in there. And that's just one day. Yeah. yeah. Especially in monsoons. And that's an easy way to make money for your company. Like if we had a big monsoon, probably recommend a filter clean to most people or use, you know, backwashing for sure. Um, if you have a sand or DE, but back to your point with the pile, big pile of dirt or big, like all you have, you have to be adaptable too. you know, just our main thing was every six months, but there was customers we had on every three months or every four months because we would realize like, especially with in-floor systems, like if you, 
you can't go six months because they stop working for two months or, you know, the, you don't have enough pressure to your heads after four months. So you should clean it. That was my chore as a kid was uh, cleaning the filters. And my dad had a big eight stack, big old cartridge oh, filter. Yeah. And uh, like the Hayward one. The Hayward one. Yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd be carrying, those, carrying them 50 feet out to the garage or driveway. And then uh, as soon as I move out, suddenly he gets a cyclone on there and only has to clean them every year or year and a half now. So <laughs> that's <laughs> Instead of every three or four months. Yeah. He's like, I'm not doing that. Yeah, that's a lot of work. How yeah. can I make it easier? Yeah, for sure. Exactly. Thanks, Dad. But I think it's, we preach this quite a bit, but I think it's uh, equally important to make sure that you have a good CRM so that you take photos every time you're cleaning these things and you're doing the bid so that when, say, one of our technicians is out and saying, I'm having issues with this pool, and we go back to that um, customer's account and we're bringing up the last filter clean, the last repair um, all those different things. And we're putting that data together to see, you know what? He did make a note that these were probably going to have to be replaced next time. I bet you they finally kind of kicked it and we need to get in there and have them replaced. And I bet you that's going to solve the problem. Those, those are the things that I think a lot of people don't do because that seems extremely inconvenient when it's really hot outside. But you, if you make that a habit, it's really going to make your life easier when stuff comes up because the whole team makes it a habit to do that. And they call in or the technician calls in, you go to the computer, type in the customer's name, look at it, be like, you know what, I'm almost positive that that's the problem. And you're going to love it because you're going to jump in there and you're going to tell the customer like, hey, we need to replace these cartridges or whatever. And it's like, okay, whatever. Like, you're going to feel really good proof. that, yeah, you're going to feel really good that, you know, you made these notes because they got them last time. You did it. It's going to solve the problem and everything's going to be working good. Tech's happy. The homeowner's happy that they can trust you because you know what you're doing. And, you know, a real professional is always documenting everything. You know what I mean? Communication. Exactly. Communication is key. And back to your point about taking pictures of heads and how many like pipes are going, you know, which kind of ports and that was what we did too on the initial bids was taking pictures of a head, taking pictures of how many pipes, putting that in the notes. Because when you, if you're not a one man team, if you have other, you know, people out there cleaning pools for you, they're pretty, you're pretty much going to get a note that says in floor is not working or pop up head came out. Like that's what we would get all the time. But if you have the initial pictures of you and you know what's installed in that pool, then that's super easy for you to take that and give it to your repair team and say, all right, what needs one of these needs this exact head. It needs this, you know, six port gear set. And you can do that without having to make another trip out there for your repair team, which saves a lot of time and money. So that's what we try to do with most, most enforce systems is document what they have at the pool with everything. But well, something I think I wish we would have done uh, a lot better. And we, talked about it constantly was just when problems came up like that, we actually really took the time to reach out to the reps and really figure out like how this works, why this happened, how we can be proactive, how we can talk to the customer better about um, certain things. There's all these, all these different things that we wish that we would have just spent a little bit more time in doing because it's like master that and keep it in the archive and then, you know, use that uh, to train your team and then move on. So when another problem happens with anything else, have the same approach with it. It's, we understand it is really difficult to do that because you're getting in, you're like, dude, I just got to get this shit done. It's, I have a million other things to do today, but man, if you can really just kind of slow your roll down and figure that out or make a real good note of it and reach out to like you guys and figure it out. And then, Hey, go to the drawing board on a Saturday. Sometimes that's what you got to do is get in there and be like, you know what? There's no phone calls. There's no nothing right now. Like I'm just going to like take the time um, to really understand it and then figure out a way to explain it to my team. Well, and the reps want to help you out too. Cause if I can help someone out who has 80, hundred pools, that's help. That's exponentially helping us out, you know, yeah, as far as everybody wins. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're going to able to take that information and pass it on to all your pools. So, and I've been out to pools where someone suffered 30 minutes every week vacuuming it. We make a small tweak. Now it's a 10 minute stop, five minutes. I mean, yeah, yeah I mean, so right. it's efficient. Not five right? minutes. So now I know, I know. I can. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, see me check myself. Out, yeah, uh, not five nope, minutes. Nope, nope. <laughs> not hiring you to clean my Right. <laughs> <laughs> I said I did it for six months. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. Obviously, putting the work into it. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you said, doing it on a Saturday or whatever. But I mean, if you take some time and you diagnose and you document you do all that it saves you so much more time down the road of course right 
And then at the same time, you can grow your business so you can add more accounts. I mean, it just, it's a domino effect. The more you put a little bit of work into it, obviously the reps, you know, us here all over the country, I mean, that's our job. We want to help our customers. We want to help them with their business so they succeed. They're successful. They can, you know, on Saturdays, hopefully not be doing that eventually and hanging out with their families. I mean, that's what it's all about. But your job is also to teach them, right? 100%. You don't want to go back to the same technician every other week telling them the same exact thing. So like, you know, when you're getting taught, when you guys take the time, your time out of your day to come teach us things, like it's our do job and duty to then learn that and then put it into our business or teach and train our employees. Oh, you remember that pool that you, you know, Mrs. Jones pool you had this problem with? This is the problem. So next time, if you see that again, this is probably what it is. Correct. We're going to push you out of the nest. <laughs> right. <laughs> but there's also a lot of marketing opportunities with that. If yeah. You guys had talk to us about it. Like I want to master it so that now I can do a YouTube video on it. I could create a video that's really cool that a customer will understand and put it on my website. And it's just putting trust, um, into the customer that like, man, this company, they really get, they really understand. Um, this is the same system I have. I didn't know that before, but now I know, I think I should have these guys out to, you know, take a look at this. You can go on Instagram and you can go on Facebook and you can be on all these different um, social mediums and you can talk about these things like a professional and you're going to be sincere and you're going to, it's going to come out very naturally because you truly understand. And when you don't really understand things a hundred percent, you're just not going to want to talk about it. And, you know, unfortunately we live in uh, a time where, you have to have social presence. You have to have a good website and um, you don't have to do some of those, but if you want to really stand the test of time, like you're going to want to do all those different things, a lot of different benefits. So what kind of pool and surroundings do M4 systems really work best for? So when M4 cleaning systems first were basically started here in Arizona, obviously we have more dirt and dust. Um, as times progressed with new technology and stuff, particularly Greg was referring to the ABSC drains or channel drains, you know, drains that can get these larger debris. Um, it really works with all different environments. And I'll give you an example. I mean, Texas is, is a perfect example. I've been to Texas numerous times in Houston and Dallas and their backyards. I mean, they have oak leaves. They have things that, you know, we've never even seen before here in Arizona. Um, and, and they work really well there. So that really gives you a good sense that with the proper drain, the Venturi skimmer, definitely because the Venturi skimmer is grabbing some of that larger debris and stuff before it actually hits the floor too. So think about that. So obviously in order to get into the pool, it's got to start from the top. So if we have really good skimming with variable speed pumps and whatnot, and we could, then you pull all that stuff off the top. Now your drain isn't ha having to take some of that larger debris. But if it does hit the bottom, it's going to be able to pick the larger debris as well. But I would say 25, 30 years ago, if you'd asked me that question, I would just say dirt, dust, you know, smaller debris, because that's really what it was intended for, because it just what didn't have the types of drains that could pick up that larger debris. I'm sure you've seen drains out there that, um, you know, they were flat and they had like little holes and stuff in there. I mean, you're not going to get a leaf through that hole, you know. And that's Arizona leaves, which are yeah, tiny, tiny here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. There are many leaves compared to not everything's big in Texas leaves. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but that's but that's yeah. in saying that you have new pop up heads with the the right main drain, you know, because you could very well have an M4 system pool with like, you know, crazy trees around it, a lot of dirt coming in. But if it's not up to date, it's got an older main drain. It's really just, of course, like a suction side vacuum or a pressure side cleaner is gonna is gonna work better. Yeah, I would say um, just to kind of go off of that because yeah. you know, an M4, uh, a new system is yeah, it, it could probably do pretty well for everything. But um, most of the time, like you're not seeing like just a brand new. Yeah, we're taking on pools brand that new setup. aren't brand new a lot of the time. I would say, too, the M4 system um, is really good for steps and benches, right? So areas where the cleaner is just not going to get. Obviously, a suction cleaner needs a certain amount of water in order to not suck air. Um, and so having those heads on the floors and the steps, I'm sorry, the steps and the benches, bar stools, whatever, 
area is able to push all that stuff onto the floor and then whether it be a cleaner or something. And we didn't necessarily talk too much about this before, but there's different in floor cleaning systems besides cleaning systems. So um, some people put in floor heads in on the steps and the benches and put a cleaner on the floor in certain markets. And then some in certain markets just use it as a, a circulation system. Because as I mentioned before, there are huge benefits to in floor, uh, not just on cleaning, but obviously on heating, on chemically distributing water, um, you know, just circulating water in general on the floor. So having those benefits and then doing something different, maybe on the cleaning side, obviously is, is just as, not just as good, but is also good. So, Right. And I think this ties into our next question really well. Yeah. Is, you know, we've often seen the in-floor system bypassed and a cleaner installed, did the skimmer with a, you know, a vac mate or something like that. Um, like, why do you think that is? I think a lot of that goes back to just the complications and just it being uh, a tougher system to diagnose than looking back at a vacuum and see if it's chugging along the pool. So if it's more work, it, it's it's going to be a little tougher to uh, diagnose and easier for the the pool professional to throw a vacuum in. But, but that is but that is a difficult thing because you can't it, just because the water's blowing, you can't really see it that well. And it was really nice. Katie was just talking to us about um, the dye that you buy that you put in, and you can actually see the dye shoot out through the in floor system to actually see oh, you know what. Which areas where, it's covering? What, what areas it's it's covering? And um, never heard that before, but it makes total sense. You know what I mean? Especially if you're up there, because I think that's a lot of what we did. Since we didn't fully understand in floor systems, um, it might be just easier to um, sell a cleaner, and it really didn't have anything to do with uh, money Price, because yeah. there's not really much. Uh, the margins are not very good in cleaners, yeah. so it yeah. definitely didn't have anything to do with that because. If you truly understood in floor systems, you can, I think, make a lot more in your business in replacing gear sets and heads oh, and different things like filter cleans that go along with it. Um, there's tons of benefits to it. Yeah, I think, you know, I'm glad you said that because I think it is just getting educated. Right. And it's really hard. Like Greg said, when you, if you if, like we didn't know for a long time and we just understand vacuums and then you hear about this vacuum thing that sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, but I let you, you know, set up a vacuum in a pool that it wasn't an option before. Like you can just put it in there, you know, and it's, it saves you and it puts you, gets you back into your comfort zone, I think in a way where you now I can take care of this pool the way I want to take care of your it. Wheelhouse. Right. I want to focus on your one little thing. That's where you guys come in too. Cause Absolutely. you guys can help, Absolutely. you know, call the reps up. They can help teach you these things. If you have pools that have issues, and because a lot of times the customers buy those, well, sometimes they buy come into that pool, but if they buy the pool, then they specifically wanted the in floor for a reason. And, you know, it's your kind of job to keep what they currently Correct. have. They and the system is designed that. to run with those, right? So if you're bypassing it, then you're not really doing what the system is designed to do. But in the same, you know, if they do have an old main drain, like we're talking about, and big oak trees or something, sometimes you know, even if their in-floor system is operating correctly, it's more beneficial to put a cleaner in either as well alongside it, like you said, just so the water gets circulated, but it's also cleaning and, you know, you're getting that bigger debris. It just depends on the setup, but there's a way, there's a reason to use vacuums and vacuum mates. I think it's in certain pools. Yeah. And I don't want to forget this because this was a, a habit that we had formed and it was a really bad habit that I think a lot of other companies do is that you just kind of want a, say, a suction side cleaner in a pool because the hoses are permanently in the pool and it makes it that much easier to vacuum a pool. Um, yeah. <laughs> especially for, you know, technicians, it's like it's much easier to have them uh, vacuum a pool manually, like just pull out the vac head and the hoses already in there and vacuum a pool opposed to bringing out the hoses, sinking the hose and going through the skimmer. So that was a whole nother thing. And one thing I can say is if we could go back, I would, when doing a bid or coming across a situation where we were going to go with the uh, suction side vacuum, we're going to take that route and approach a customer that way. I would maybe contact a rep for that in floor system and see if it was even possible to have them come out to that house for me oh, and absolutely. say, Hey, I would normally do this, but I think it's right to keep the system that they already have. 
and this is what's going on with the pool and you could see for yourself and you very well you this is what you guys do for a living you'd look at it and be like you know what dude i'm gonna adjust this real quick because this already is uh you know i can see this already being an issue and then just go through um all the different things because i think once that happens um and you get really comfortable with the representative of any uh, manufacturing company you're just gonna be you're gonna feel really good about it you know all the we are really lucky to have a lot of good reps with us and once we got done with them we always felt like um extremely empowered like we really um just knowing it that much better and having the literature that we would usually get from them on you know how to talk with the customer and everything's like that it's just uh it's pretty powerful well, and stuff. you guys have a lot to learn too like our niche as far as reps is our specific stuff. So we know that to a depth that's very difficult for the average service guy to get to. You guys know so many different products, heaters, every pump filter, like there's so much stuff to know. Like I commend you guys on knowing all that stuff, but as far as our products go, like I'm the rep for it. Like I, I should know this better than anybody. So utilize it. Exactly. And give, and give feedback. I, I think people don't truly understand when they're just like, I don't use that shit because it doesn't do da 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 da. And it's like, dude, people are building products for they're they're trying to sit in the middle of all these different variables. Like, put your give them your opinion. Maybe they're that's how people that's how companies become innovative is because they get feedback and they're like, hey, this is something that happens on half of my pools. It'd be really awesome if it could do this, dude. Things don't happen by you bitching and complaining in a Facebook group yeah. or something like that. Things happen and things change when you like step up to the plate. And when they say, if you have any feedback, we'd like to hear it. Like, that's not where you just say, I I'm just going to leave. That's your opportunity to say, hey, this is a problem. And it would be awesome if you guys would take it into consideration. Maybe the next time you're doing R&D, this question has come up more than a few times. And it's something that, you know, we can work on. Like. That's how Speak, it works. Speaking of that, you guys are doing a great job with podcasts <laughs> oh, for, thank, fe for feedback. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. <laughs> so you, you bring up a really good point. And, and, you know, I was talking before about the history of Infloor and the pop-up, you know, that whole concept of staying flesh and then popping up. I mean, they the reason they wanted to do that is because customers didn't want to have something stationary. You know, they were getting feedback saying, hey, you know, it just was kind of stubbing toes. Yeah, you know. <laughs> So that's where the idea was, well, why don't we have it so it goes flush and then pops back up? I mean, so without that feedback, you know, a lot of times new products don't come about. And the other thing I wanted to mention, too, is is when you just throw a suction cleaner in or whatever and don't diagnose or whatnot, um, it's possible, and you guys know, I'm sure, from your business before, is you had another service guy that was taking care of that account. Something happened. You take over. Well, that guy maybe changed a head out, didn't do his homework, didn't take pictures, didn't do all those important things you're supposed to do, and then put the head in, and that was a different size nozzle, different size orifice, and now things are out of balance, like Greg was talking about, the importance of balancing all the zones out. So if all that stuff isn't taken into consideration, yeah, I mean, they're throwing the suction cleaner in there because the cleaning system's not worked correct the way it was originally designed. And if you don't do it that way, it's not going to work properly. So just taking the time and you said reaching out to the representatives and stuff because we can tell just by looking at the pool taking out a couple of the heads and looking at the nozzle sizes on where everything's supposed to be and then obviously troubleshooting the valve and whatnot but making sure all those zones are balanced yeah when you learn all that too like you just you sound so much more educated to the customer and the customer is much more likely to say yes to paying you know eighty dollars for oh, all, all new sets of heads right you pull out a years. pressure gauge and hook it up to their top step yeah. and they're checking pressure there they're gonna they're gonna open up their wallet yeah they understand <laughs> well they understand that they're dealing with a professional absolutely right? yeah, not not somebody you. that's just saying uh, you need to fix all of them or replace all of them you can then explain to them why not you know? a melvin yeah well, that's... not a melvin <laughs> no melvin's on this job <laughs> well that's uh <laughs> I, I think that's what pool uh service professionals don't do very well is the sales yep it's like what's in it for them not being so aggressive where it's like this ain't working right like i'm having to spend an hour at your <laughs> shitty pool it's Back not my need. it's not my problem it's like okay what what do i need to do i don't but it is your problem because it's your job right <laughs> but but you need to but you need to speak with them and say hey aren't you having issues that the pool is clean you know, after I get done with it, but after that, it's just 
getting dirty really quick because, you know, the system isn't working properly, you know, and then discussing like how, you know, having an updated system or having new heads or a new module or all these different things is going to benefit them because I can only be here once a week. If it is just a basic residential pool, I can only be here once a week. And my job as a professional is to make sure that I'm like making you aware of, you know, the products that are out there and that are available that'll make this even better. Or, um, you know, just the different things like that. Just, I think we all need to educate ourselves better in, um, how to sell, you know, and that's not anybody that thinks that's a bad thing. Like maybe, you, maybe this isn't for you because when we started our business, that's how we feed our families. That's how we do what we do. It feels really good because one, we're solving problems for customers and two, we're making a good living um, and providing for our family. That's, that's what it's all about. And if you don't see it that way, I'm not really sure what you're doing. Like, to be honest, for sure. <laughs> Sometimes I go off on that. Yeah, aren't you getting tired of swimming with chia pets? Yeah. You know, when, when we're, when we're not here, I know I am. <laughs> Oh, something bit me. <laughs> well, that gets in, I guess the kind of sales thing rolls into the, my next question is really, you know, let's kind of switch gears a little bit from, you know, there's lots of variables in this, but from like a builder or a remodel perspective, you know, if a client's wondering whether or not I should go with an in-floor system or a vacuum system, you know, how can the pool professional decide which is right for that client and how would you think it, explain it to them? So first of all, I would say just having that conversation as far as the benefits. So again, it's it's funny. We talk about M4 cleaning system, but an M4 system is more than just cleaning. Right? Distributing chemically treated water, it's better circulation, it's heating better, all of those wonderful benefits besides obviously cleaning the swimming pool. And now with the channel drains and venturi skimmers and variable speed pumps and being able to dial everything in, the, the cleaning system really does an amazing job. There are other markets, though, where they might, uh, you know, it could be a budget thing too, right? I mean, that, that happens. So yeah. I would say having a Not my problem. What? Not my problem. Not my pro <laughs> <laughs> You're the one that bought a house with a pool. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. So um, obviously, you know, as a salesperson for, for a new construction, having that conversation with the customer and talking about what their budget and stuff is, in floor plays a part because it is a little bit more money than installing a suction cleaner in a dedicated line. Or obviously in other markets, you have pressure cleaners with a separate booster pump. Um, What's that? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> That's for another there podcast. There are pools outside of Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what I was going to say was um, having any sort of cleaning system, you know, whether it be a full cleaning system or a hybrid where you have heads on the steps and the benches, or even just a circulation system where you have heads on the floor, I think is a huge benefit. Personally, I mean, obviously we work for ANA. Uh, we'd want to see an in-floor cleaning system in every swimming pool, but because of budgets and all these different factors, that's maybe not possible. But I think um, just the way pools are built, you're always going to have steps and benches. So there really aren't cleaners that are going to clean all of that. So if there's a way to put your steps and your benches and have cleaning heads on there, I would highly, highly recommend it. Obviously it's just going to do a better job. Or, Which is a huge, it's a huge yeah. complaint from customers. I mean, oh, yeah. even with vacuum systems, it's like, well, why are my stairs and benches always dirty? Because that's where they hang out. Mm -hmm. And on tan, now, now they're building Baja decks and tanning ledges. And if there's not something to clean that off, then it just gets dirty. Or sometimes, like you said earlier, if the pH is off, it's going to stain it because it just sits there during that whole week. So that's a huge complaint from homeowners is like why is the floor clean where i don't hang out but everywhere i hang out it's super dirty well, right <laughs> what pushy's mentioned before too there's a peace of mind that comes with uh an in floor system he says like bushy's <laughs> pool was built before he was there but he has a vacuum and he says multiple times a day he's peeking out there and looking to see if that thing's chugging along because something can get stuck in it and now the whole pool's not cleaning sure I, I have a problem. <laughs> I'm aware of it. I'm I'm always concerned of whether or not the cleaner is moving. I've been doing this long enough. It's like, you know. Yeah. That pool better be clean. Look at that thing. That thing's moving. We always like used to say something like, that thing is like Tony Hawking out of the pool. You get to a pool and that thing is like, whoa. <laughs> Grinding. Ooh, frontside caballero. <laughs> On the deep end. It's pretty good for a four wheel. <laughs> think he's got what it takes to win a gold this year did you see um i just saw uh 
clip on a skateboarding uh, video. The guy did, was it 1020 or something? Yeah. Off the mega ramp. That was unbelievable, dude. Yeah. I was like, holy cow. Man. Those guys are ser- like 17, 20 feet in the air off the mega ramp is just insane, dude. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> these guys. 20 feet and your suspension is your legs. Yeah. 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 No, <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> And they just get younger and younger. It's like, oh, da da da, to Southern California, just turned nine. Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Sheckler. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> just turned, just had his ninth birthday. Nice. He says he does not like girls. <laughs> Favorite thing to do is eat cookies and. <laughs> so funny oh man that's awesome uh, so one thing we kind of really try to talk about which we always wondered about you know in our service business was warranty stuff so you know if something goes wrong and it's under warranty how do you guys how does the process work with ANA? so as far as uh ANA specifically we have um you can call our office and uh through that the homeowner just has to verify that they are the original homeowner for warranty and um, which is a big thing which is a big thing Yes. A lot of people don't understand that. Yes. Yeah, if you're the original homeowner <laughs> and uh, the builder submitted the plans and everything, you uh, you will have your heads and gear kits covered for life. So, Oh, for life? For life. Yeah. Wow. We have a lifetime warranty on all of our products, yes. But it has to be the original homeowner. It has to be the original homeowner, correct. Yeah, non-transferable. And then from there, there's several different ways they can get product. They can either will call it from us. They can authorize their pool professional to come down and will call it for us as long as they put we put their name uh, on the list. And then... Or they can get stuff mailed to them. So that all gets done through the office. Yeah. And we've talked about this before, you know, taking photos and helping out with that stuff as well. If you're installing all these things, like make sure that you document it because, man, you're a lot more likely to get, you know, a Google or Yelp review when they say, oh, do you have any information on this? I know that this is kind of, I'm supposed to keep all the paperwork and this and that. It's like, don't worry about it. I can send it all over to you or I can reach out to ANA, da, 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 da. And if you know that process, it's insane um, how much that really helps your relationship with customers because you never know when you're going to, you're going to need that. You know, when something, something goes wrong and they're like, don't, don't worry about it, man. Exactly. Like it's a, you've yeah, always it's, been there for me. Yeah, exactly. You're exactly. Yes. Yeah, so I would say kind of back to what you guys were talking about, taking pictures of the heads and stuff. So if somebody's taking over a pool for the first time, maybe talk to the homeowner and ask them if they're the original owner. Cause that way you have that documentation right away. And then if something does happen, you already have that information as opposed to, cause I'm, I'm sure there's t- been instances where people, go and they replace a product and there was a warranty and then they go back to the customer and tell them X and they say, Oh, I thought I already had a warranty on that. Da, 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 da. So having that information ahead of time, when, you know, when something does happen, obviously it's a lot easier to deal with as opposed to going back. That's a really good initial big question. I don't, I don't ever ask that if you were the original owner of the pool. It's or really if they have any warranties on anything on the pool. Yeah. yeah. Are you the owner of this house? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Is this a rental house or do you own it? Because I don't oh, no. know. Who I, want. I don't need to deal with you if you're the rental. Well. Yeah, Airbnb. Airbnb. <laughs> and that's a whole other podcast. Um, so let's jump into some more ANA stuff specifically. Like we talked about earlier, if you don't really know what you're doing or seeing in the field, like how do you know it's an ANA system and what kind of different types are out there? Yeah, so I'll kind of briefly go over just the history of some of the products, and you'll know if it's an ANA product. So we started off with the Gould valve, which has the little marbles on top and is piston driven. Uh, then after that, um, we had a ball valve, which has the big inch and a half diameter balls that sat on top of the pipes, got moved out of the way, water went to the zone, and then it transitioned to the next one. Um, the issue we found with those was that as that ball's rocking back and forth thousands of times, it's ovalizing the pipe or the inlet of the water valve and that's causing bypass to all the different zones not just where you want the water to go to so the cleaning heads are getting less and less pressure as that valve gets older and older and uh so from there we're like all right let's come up with something different so we came up with the flaps the only issue with the flaps is they're great as far as they allow a ton amount of water flow through them they are um sending a lot of pressure to one particular zone for a long amount of time before they transition there's no water hammer the issue was that uh, they were glued in and we 
people they they last a long time, but when they are ready to be changed, it's a little frustrating for pool techs to have to glue those in, wait for the glue to set up, and then either have a return call back to turn it on or just uh, then have another flap break in a couple weeks when it's good to do all those at the same time. But so from those flaps, we went to the push in T flaps, which is what we have now, and those are uh, a great design. They seal really well. They're easy to change, and uh, it's just a really, really good product right now. That's cool, though, like we were talking about listening to feedback earlier, because I've glued in several of those, yes. and it's a big pain in the butt. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Yeah, so <laughs> it's one of my favorites. I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> it's 110 out sitting over some glue, glue fumes. <laughs> so, you know, if you do have an older one that doesn't have the push-ins, which is really awesome, um, you know, they make conversion kits, right? So if you have a ball kit, you can convert it to a flap or you can replace the ball kit, right? So within the next couple of weeks, we will have uh, a retro so where you can push in, have push in flaps on any style valve out there. Five port, six port, low pro top feed. We're going to have, uh, we're going to have push in flaps available on everything. So that's pushy pretty, just, that's pushy pretty, just that's pretty the major right there. Yeah, that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the drop. It's, it's going to, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be great. We're going to have a, a lot of valve replacements out there. That's going to be really big. It's yeah. cool. And what's great too about the T valve too is is it gets much more water to each of the zones. So now it kind of comes back to the cleaning systems maybe hasn't been working for a while since they've had it, whatever the case might be. Now we're going to go from ball to T. Now we're going to get better water to the heads and the cleaning system is going to just do a better job. Right. Are you guys going to have um, maybe some new videos and different things like that oh, on, on how to, how to do all of that? Yeah. I'll, uh, once there's... Um, once all the products are available, I'll probably do a couple of videos on actually cutting out valves and gluing them on. Cause that's guys see cutting six pipes and that's uh, that gets a little, it's little intimidating. Little man. You yeah, just gotta be time. perfect. Hey, you got one with you. I know one that needs to be done right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's go do it. House. 10 minutes away. Let's yeah. go do it at 115 heat <laughs> yeah. at 11 o'clock. All right. That's how you get the <laughs> full <live>. effect. <laughs> just sweating your ass just off. YouTube live pool chasers. <laughs> yeah. I should do one video w when you had to glue it. And then another video of just like kind of tapping on it with a hammer or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, but that's your to your point though. That's you know, it's super intimidating trying to make one cut across six pipes, and if it's not right, you're in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> everything is uneven. So as far as like the controllers look, how do they look, and how do you tell which one's a gold, which ones, you know? Yeah. So the uh, the Gould valve valve fed from the top, but it fed from the center of the valve. If you look at it, it comes directly from the center. Um, if you're looking at a top feed. Uh, five port or six port our newer generation after the Gould valve it's a little off centered the water comes in just about half an inch or an inch to the side of the direct center so you can tell just by looking at the lid that way um, and then the low pro obviously that guy feeds in from the side it has a opaque lid that you can see through and um, is it just a really good valve design what color are they um so the Gould and top feeds are tan um, our new one that we're going to have that's going to be pressed in is going to be black so you'll, we'll be able to recognize when you go into the backyard if it's been replaced or not. Uh, we have a new material for that. But uh, the low pros are gray or black. Um, we have them um, an inch and a half and two inch. The uh, bodies are gray or black. So you can't tell just by looking at the color, but you got to look at the pipe size to see see what it is. So Thank you. Very cool. Um, so we obviously think you guys have a great product and you're one of the leaders in the industry for sure. But, you know, all systems kind of break at some point. So what are the most common things you guys see out in the field that you hear? Um, so it, that goes back to uh, how to diagnose an infloor. There's three things. Either the, the heads are broken, the valves are broken, or there's not water flow. So we'll ignore water flow for now because we're looking, talking about diagnosing issues but um, and replacing stuff. But uh, gear kits and cleaning heads are probably the number one. If you get a new gear kit, in there and with new flaps in the water valve and then you replace the cleaning heads you're going to have almost a brand new system from uh from where it was how do you know if a gear kit needs to be replaced though so a gear kit there's multiple ways uh you're going to look at the cleaning heads if the cleaning heads aren't changing stations then the gear kit needs to be replaced because it's not uh it's not functioning properly if you open up when you open, i saw you need, you need i'm asking this because i saw the video yeah, yeah. when you hold when you're holding the gear set and you yeah, can yeah. spin yeah, things so, how yeah, do you so kind of see there's little tricks you can so once you get the gear kit the biggest way is i'm looking at a pool and the only the spa heads are popping up and then i've been there several minutes and they haven't rotated so i'm like all right something weird's going on you can walk over to the water valve nice thing about the low pro is i can look in there and see if the gears are rotating 
Although in this uh, instance, they were still rotating, but once you pulled the gear kit out, you could see that some of the gears were stripped out. So once you remove it, you can inspect it, try spinning the gears, see how, make sure everything's functioning properly. If it's not, then it's just a, it's just a new gear kit. And it's also good to, good to do flaps while you're in there. That's a big thing that uh, people kind of just steer away from or don't, uh, they'll change the gear kit over and over. But it's because you had to glue them in. It's because you had to glue them. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main yes. reason people steered away yes. from it. Yeah. But if you solve that problem. Exactly. Then. Exactly. It's always really good, though, you're right, to change out those flaps. Yeah. Because yeah. then you know that that system, that system is good for a while. Because what happens is as those flaps wear, they're sitting lower and lower, and they're grinding on the gear kit, which is going to cause you to go through more gear kits. So unless you're selling gear kits... <laughs> which you are which you are <laughs> still replace those flaps <laughs> for sure so what kind of you know all these different repairs you might have to do what are all the different tools that you know you're going to need so for uh tools for a and a for the water valve there's really only one tool that i can think of maybe two um a and the a and a flap removal tool is for preston flaps and uh, it goes underneath the inch and a half or two inch it's like a, a claw of a hammer kind of it gets underneath there pops the flaps out and then uh, it has another piece for tapping the flaps back in. Um, this is not an A&A product, but a tool that I like to use. Um, Multi-torque, am I saying that right? Yes. yes. There's a tool, yeah, and it has in there a piece for taking a filter apart, but I use it on the low profile or our water valves. And with my drill, I can take those off in two seconds compared to say they're spinning them over by hand over and over and over. So, Oh, nice. I really like that. But as far as our cleaning heads go, we have a, a tool for every cleaning head style. And... Um, and then the pressure tester, that's a huge thing. That pressure tester that you can plug in to the top uh, step and test pressure there, you're going to be able to get all those pools of variable speed pumps uh, dialed in real nice. What's a tool look like that you use to remove heads? And there's a plastic and like metal. Yeah, versions, so we have right? plastic and metal. The plastic is for homeowners. That's not for you guys. This, uh, professionals need to have metal tools. And I know they've been pricey for a while. We actually have a brand new design coming out of a uh, Style 2, which is a three-prong. It has metal prongs. And it's a metal tool, so they're not uh, the pins aren't coming out anymore, like we were with the plastic tool. And then the uh, the metal G4 tool is just a nicer looking tool. Um, it's going to be a little less expensive than before, and we've kind of beefed up some of the parts on it so that it's not uh, not bending or anything on you guys. So it kind of looks like a little claw with like prongs that go into those yeah. slots. Yeah. So depending on the head, there's the most popular are the three prong three slot or three prongs where the tool goes in. There's three pins that stick in there. It kind of grips the head twist it counterclockwise, remove it out. And then the newest style that's been in pools for the last 10 years probably are the G4, which is the two slots. The head goes in there. You twist it counterclockwise. It grips the head. So when you go to pull it out, it's holding onto the cleaning head. You can pull it all the way to the side of the pool. I've got my eight foot pole that I can, is a locking pole. So it goes all the way out. I can rarely have heads that I can't get to uh, with that tool. So Nice. And is that, do they come with the heads or is it you buy those separately? Yeah, the, the tools come separately. Um, if you build a new swimming pool, we do give you, give the homeowner a plastic tool that goes with their, with their system to start off with. But uh, yeah, through distribution, you guys can pick up the, the tools for the plastic or the metal. Okay. Those, yeah, definitely the metal ones. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So you're, for everybody out there, you're not supposed to use needle nose pliers <laughs> with the two, uh, <laughs> the two holes you will damage it you will damage it <laughs> now i have done it you know oh, swimming down there with needle been. nose but yeah. <laughs> you're supposed to use the <laughs> tools <laughs> i mentioned venturi earlier regarding the technology and um, the venturi heads that we've had out now for a couple of years work really well with variable speed techn technology you asked me about um you know innovation the last 20 years and obviously, everybody knows the variable speed pump is, is huge. Obviously, you're saving a lot of money. You're able to run your RPMs lower, save electricity. And more importantly, you can still get the same amount of flow. And you don't need that one and a half single, two horse, one horse. You're able to dial it in in between those horsepowers. And with our technology, we have a Venturi head that actually can pull water in from the top. So those heads that have the holes on the top that I had mentioned previously are actually pulling water in from the top. And then we're also putting water in from the bottom, just like a traditional in-floor head. And when we're able to do that, we actually can run our variable speed pumps now much lower than the traditional variable speed pump. And by doing that, we're actually able to clean the same, if not more, than the traditional cleaning head, but actually use less water, which of course saves the customer money, because now they're actually not running their pump nearly as hard as they 
used to have to. By running it lower, you're just taking the whole system and dialing it down a notch. It's going to filter slower, which is going to filter better when it's not pounding water through the filters. Uh, it's less wear and tear on the equipment as we're running at a lower speed. And then that ties in with our Venturi skimmer, which shoots six gallons a minute underneath it with the nozzle down there, and it draws in 60 gallons through the throat. So what that allows us to do now is pull a lot more through the drain and still get great skimming action and just by investing that small amount of water through the Venturi. So. Right. And I feel like that's just music to the homeowner's ears that it's going to be able to do all that. And, you know, just the, you know, saving the wear and tear on the equipment is is huge because the pumps, the filters, all those different things, um, they're not cheap. And if you can put something on the pool, especially if you're uh, remodeling or building a pool and you can be really proactive in by installing all those different things, um, that's a, you know, it's a good investment, especially if you explain it correctly to them. Yeah. And the Venturis aren't just available on our newest model, the G4s, which are within the last 10 years on our style twos, the three prongs, we have Venturi on there as well. That's kind of a little known fact. So as long as the pool has a variable speed pump, even if it's an older pool, we still have the Venturi style available for those. So, Oh, nice. Oh, one last question I want to ask, because I don't think we really talked about it yet. And we're about to close down this episode. Can I just say one thing about yeah. that? What, one thing one thing you really see out in the field, I guess, for everybody out there, as far as Venturi we're talking about, is the pipes and the equipment will say quick skim. That's an indicator that it has one. So it's you know, if you're wondering why it says quick skim, that's what that's what we're talking yeah, to. Yeah, and that's going to be on the, the pressure side. Yeah, quick skim, correct? Yeah. Yep. So, you know, what is the best practice for making sure that the pop ups stay down so that you can vacuum a pool and not have it disrupting? Because yeah. if you're vacuuming a you pool, you want to everything settle. to stay down. Correct. You don't want correct. you know just you don't want things being kicked up into suspension yeah. so that when you get to exactly. it, it's because regardless, we have a big. Um, storm or something like that pool's going to have to be vacuumed there's only so much that there any pool system can can handle um so it's you know what is best practices when vacuuming uh, a pool that has infloor system yeah so with the infloor system um you would probably want to send the water to the returns so bypass the infloor open up your return line and then uh from there you're going to want to take off if it if it's equipped with a quick skim that's the venturi skimmer there's a jumper piece at the front of it that blocks the suction port to the um, for the vacuum to be installed into, and that piece does not get glued in. So you would just hand reach down there, pull out that jumper piece, um, set it to the side, install your vacuum right there, and then go back to the three way and pull all your suction from the from the skimmer. Okay. But back to we said, take a picture of how the valves are set before you start. Yes. <laughs> picture or marker. Changing them and also. Do it before you turn the system on, because if you turn the system on and then change the valves, you probably already just shot everything in suspension anyway. So, and understand pretty much that, jacked at that point. <laughs> you know, we don't live in a perfect world where things are labeled correctly. So right. keep, yeah. well, keep yeah. labels on, and understand that people can label things wrong. And if you figure that out, just scratch that label off and put a new one on, because that is that's huge. You know, it's like no, it says that, and be like that. The manufacturer did not put that there. Like the plumber, the pool person that was here that did this last, they're the ones that put that label there. I was on a pool last week that had skimmer and drain backwards. Yep. And I figured it out. I'm like, wow, that's how long have those been like that? <laughs> yeah. That's common, man. Yeah. That's not. That's, yeah, that's, it's, it's the first time I'd seen it. But okay. Yeah. I mean, it's not like super, super common, yeah. but I've seen it several times Crazy. where they're, they're labeled backwards. But like a little kid can put a sticker on plumbing. It's yeah. not. <laughs> Dinosaur know. sticker. Yeah. Exactly. I don't think just because it's there, it's not something that can't be changed. Like take that shit off and put the right one there. Yeah, yeah we exactly. do make uh, labels and stuff for all the equipment. So probably for that reason. <laughs> yeah, <Right>? I probably. <laughs> um, <laughs> make sure they're using your equipment properly. Yep. So we're going to be wrapping this up here. Can you guys share, you know, just maybe one book each and maybe a podcast that has kind of really helped you in your, you know, per professional career anyway um so recently the um i love your guys podcast but another one i listen to is the jocko podcast about leadership i've really really been getting into that the last year so nice it's been a yeah great motivator and just uh yeah really good podcast what do you what do you like most about it is it just kind of that um i like that it's about taking personal responsibility and it's not uh just grab life by the horns and like take charge like it's it's work with people and it's just about leadership isn't just telling people what to do it's it's working with people partnering with people having personal relationships and it's uh it's just it's really been 
kind of eye-opening and, and inspiring at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's having more like structure and plan oriented. Um, I think a lot of that like go, 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 fight, fight, fight mentality, work hard. It's like, it's great. That is, you need that. Yeah. That is good motivational stuff, but you have to be very smart with what you do, you know, and that's that piece of it where it's like work hard, go, go, go. But you're doing all that within the plan. You know, you're paying very close attention to what your goals are and, you know, how to um, deal with people. But it's just being consistent and going through that. And I love anybody with that military background. Yeah, I'll say he's got the military be, background. <laughs> um, structured. <Check>. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, just like Goggins. Do you like Goggins? You know, I just heard about him recently from a friend and uh, I haven't listened to him yet. So, yeah, I, I've heard I've heard good things, though. So listen yeah. to his uh, episode with Joe Rogan. That was the one I probably listened to that like five times. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, dude. That's, that's amazing. Really one. What about a book? You read books? You read books? I do read books, but, um, <laughs> you know, what? there's one that uh, our boss actually had us read a year or two ago called The Best Damn Sales Book. And it was actually really cool. Yeah, it was it was interesting. Good book. But I'm more I like to read for fun. But uh, oh, what's a fun book? Fun book. Um, I like. Uh, I'm kind of weird. I like dystopian or dystopian novels like uh, 1984 or uh, stuff like that. Hunger Games stuff that's kind of weird. Yeah. Oh, like you into like sci-fi stuff? Um, no, no, not at all. I hate. I don't like. Isn't that weird? I don't like sci-fi stuff. Like my wife. Yeah, we'll watch different things that are sci-fi, and I'm like boring oh. but like <laughs> i have to be careful when i say that because i've said that before and someone's like well I, that, that's actually what i think is I'm a, real I'm, a I'm like oh i'm sorry i didn't <laughs> sorry <laughs> that's not sci-fi that's that's real that's real life that's, yeah that's <laughs> just, this is really gonna happen is this the area well, sure one people are we starting to come out to that now <laughs> sarah harry potter that's not real yeah. like no we I, worked with a lady that like acted like that oh boy. we talked about like different things remember she was always like oh well i have a group that we do this and that and we were like Oh, oh yeah. Okay. So, so, cool. So, uh, <laughs> so in college, uh, me and a couple of my friends, we rented out a house, and uh, the guy that we rented the house from, the landlord or whatever, was uh, his job was uh, basically looking for dragons. I'm not kidding. And Bigfoot, and like a couple of years later, he was actually on like I don't know. Big difference between dragons and Bigfoot. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, Bigfoot's definitely <laughs> yeah, out yeah. there. Did I, He's real. Did I touch the nerve? <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely not. He's in Santa Ana. <laughs> My grandpa always tell me we could hear him in the woods when I'd hear weird noises at night. That's Bigfoot. I'm like, what? Damn. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> wow. How long did it take you to get back to sleep? <laughs> so, yeah, can you take me home? I don't... I don't want to be here. Camping's not fun. It's part <laughs> yeah. of being the grandpa, and you can just give them back to the parents. Yeah, yeah, I just told your kid about Bigfoot, so good luck trying to get him to go to dad. sleep. <laughs> I'm he going home. He's real. <laughs> nice. So what about you, Bushy? You got a book, podcast? Uh, yeah, so um, I listen to a podcast once in a while. Um, it's actually, I think you guys heard him, Scott McCain. So he's got a, a podcast he does called Project Distinct. So I saw him years ago um, do a presentation um, basically at a pool conference or whatever. He just talks about just being a better salesperson and, you know, better uh, having basically doing a better job on creating relationships and uh, not being a used car salesman, you know, basically that mentality of, unfortunately, a lot of salespeople have that mentality and, you know, being genuine and treating the person the way you want to be treated. Um, recently, I also listened to uh, Bill Simmons, who's pretty, pretty funny dude. Um, yeah, yeah. Listened to his podcast yesterday. Actually, he was talking about the whole Andrew Luck thing and retiring and how crazy Indianapolis fans are. Oh my word! And then he was talking to David Spade, which was really cool about Chris Farley and all those SNL guys. And so that was that was pretty cool. I, I'm really trying to look for more more podcasts and stuff. I feel like some of that stuff you you only get that there, and guys are a little more open to talking about things as opposed to just a 30 second blip or you know, it feels like whatever. you're a part of the conversation because I mean, there's uh dude, podcasts are so big now that you can type in just about any actor or topic and you're going to be able to find something. Um, and people will get emotional, you know, just like there. I mean, they just had the Chris Farley documentary and had all the people talking about, you know, what was going on with that. But there's things like that, that people Terry say. Cruz on, one that we listen to that Terry Cruz. Oh yeah. That. Like that was, oh, cause that was a, yeah, about what happened to him. When he was a yeah. Kid. Yeah. That one, but yeah. I mean, his whole entire story, just that you'd open up like that, but that changes people's lives and hearing that like, dude, I just thought everything was perfect and da, 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 da. But when you hear people's like story and how they 
overcome these things or they even got to a part in their life to where you most people would quit and just say, dude, I'm just I can't stop screwing up. I'm just this is just who I am. It's like, no, I'm going to change. And they do change. And you have, uh, you know, the kind of success like some of these people have had. And it's uh, extremely motivating to know that it's never too late to make good choices and go down a different path. And just like what we're doing here with uh, pool chasers, it's never too late. It doesn't matter how old you are. If, you, if you're going to run your service company or you're going to run your remodeling company, building company, whatever it is that you're doing, it's never too late. It's never too late to go and ask for help from you guys. It's never too late to um, start caring about your team. And don't worry about what people are going to think like, oh, I wouldn't, you know, they would never think that I would be like that or do something like that. Who cares? Is it going to make your quality of life better? It's going to make everybody more educated. Yeah. Well, like who cares what people think? Like make good choices. Like just do it. You know what I mean? What about a book? So I like to read a lot of biographies and stuff. So one of the books I've read, I really liked was uh, Steve Jobs. Um, Walter Isaacson wrote it and it really talks about kind of give you a really good sense of, you know, that innovation and, and, you know, he, he started out, I don't, you know, one of the really cool thing I always thought was pretty interesting was when he started his business, he was working at Hewlett Packard and he, he talked to basically Mr. Packard and he let him have some of his items and stuff to basically kind of build his business. And, and obviously you see where Steve Jobs went from there. And it's just that idea of like passing on that knowledge and not being afraid to help somebody. And, and Steve Jobs, definitely, there's a lot of things I didn't agree with. Obviously he wasn't as personable he just, he had amazing ideas, you know, he just, he had so many, it it was, it's incredible. I mean, if you guys haven't read that book, it's really pretty cool. I mean, when you, you think about where we are now, I mean, you know, we've got our iPads and our iPhones and, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I mean, the the iPhone. And so the book talks about how that all came about and how it started with the iPod. And, but I mean, there's just so many interesting things. If you think about Apple as a whole, what they've come out with and and not, not saying Apple's better than Google, but just in general, just, the technology and reading about that, about the backstory and how all those meetings were in, you know, in the back office before it was introduced. And I just love hearing about that stuff, when, especially when you're working for a manufacturer and you see about all the cool things that, you know, people are coming out with the next big thing, you know, um, it's in every industry. And I really enjoy, you know, kind of seeing more of that kind of be behind the curtain and seeing that. And that book really has a lot of that to offer. And then I'm also reading, um, he actually has another book, Walter Isaacson. Ironically, Bill Gates recommended it because I follow Bill Gates on LinkedIn. And he did a, a biography on um, Leonardo da Vinci. That guy's an interesting. I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. That is, uh, that's Im- pretty incredible. <laughs> I mean, that guy. That, I, da sorry. Vinci's story is one of my favorites. Yeah. I mean, he's he's invented so many things and he was so smart. Um and it just, yeah, it's really, it's very, it's a very good book. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I recommend it. it really kind of gives you a sense of the innovator and how long ago that was and all the things he was thinking about and, you know, just going from town to town and, you know, and they're literally walking like hundreds of miles to go from one town to another. Um, but I think those are cool. two really good um, books and people to to read about because I think people are like, oh, my gosh, Steve Jobs heard about this. There's a lot of things that people don't realize that he actually pioneered because he the reason people really don't like him and I'm learning more about because he keeps getting brought up is he was very black and white. And a lot of people didn't like that. I mean, even down to his companies, um, he would let go the bottom 20 percent of his companies like at the end of the year like it was just black and white and never had like issues it was like dude you're the this is the top this is the 20 percent that's least performing in this in all these departments they're gotta go and they all signed up for it they all know what's going on but there's a lot of things that you know he did that was it's like we're going to continue to grow and be the best because we're going to set up systems um, that just makes sense. But everything was so black and white. It was like you do or you don't. There's no in the middle and I'm not, I don't have time to mess with anything else. Just you're either doing it or you're not. If you're not like not anything against your character, it's just you're not doing what I need you to be doing. So you have to go. Um, and I think when you really kind of go down that rabbit hole, you find a lot of really cool stuff about some of these people. Like you hear all the highlights of a lot of these uh, innovators and entrepreneurs and different things like that. But if you really 
um, open up a book about some of these people. Um, there's a lot of really cool information about them. Thank you for those two. I have to check that Da Vinci one out for sure. Yeah. Well, we'll kind of wrap it up here. Can you guys tell us where we can find out more about M4 systems and a and and how we get more info and even how we, somebody can reach out to a, a manufacturer's rep, you know, a and rep. Yeah. So uh, just go to our website, aamfg.com. And from there you can get uh, information as far as a phone number and then call and get your local Valley rep. Uh, we're also on Facebook as well. So Facebook has a, or a and has a Facebook page as well. Yeah. And our, our reps are all over the country. Um, we also have, uh, we cover international as well. So we are a global company. Um, so like Greg said, if you do call the office, you can get the appropriate rep for your area. So Very cool. All right. Well, thank you guys so much both for being here. It's been really fun and a lot of really good info. So we appreciate you taking the time. We appreciate you guys inviting us. Thank you. Yes, thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks for checking out this episode. If you want to find out more about our guests or the sponsors of the show, you can check them out on the links we have provided in the write-up below. We have also provided links to our social media platform, so please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Our tag is Pool Chasers. If the podcast has brought you any value, please do what you can to support us through our Patreon page by going to patreon.com forward slash pool chasers. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast to be updated each time a new episode is released. One last thing. If you're not yet in our Facebook group, join it today to be surrounded by like-minded individuals who are all trying to better the industry. Thank you all for the support. We appreciate your time and your ear. See you out there, pool chasers. chasers.